My name is Aiden Carney. So known as Turtle Boy. My name is Aiden Carney. So known as Turtle Boy. He is a senior editor for Turtle Boy Daily News. I'm a big fan. So we've broken hundreds of stories uh, that the mainstream media won't touch. From blogger in Massachusetts who's getting to the bottom of this better than anybody. Why is it Turtle Boy that is covering such important issues? Where is the rest of the media? You need to not say that you are going to take my baby out of revenge and make him a transgender baby. Stop it. Don't you want to ask some questions? I know you do. I do. I, I know you that. People don't like the things that I say and want me to stop saying them. But I won't. I'm never going to stop. These are the kind of stories that must be told. I will not be silenced, and we will continue on our journey for justice for John O'Keefe and for Kyron yeah. Green. Tick, tick, boom. Karen Reed has supporters who've shown up in large numbers. Tick, tick, boom. Hard body, body, and not scaring nobody. You make me result to wild, and you must be blind by the diamond side. Want it to be this way, but y'all won't need to try this. So it's no way around it. You the loudest one is going quiet. Hey, hey, hey. Serving a peace, working we serving the streets. About to go ain't going beast. Bang bang, leave you sleep. This is the first time I think I've ever seen this. An outpouring of support for someone accused of murdering a Boston police officer. Unbelievable situation. Never seen anything like it. Tick tick boom. You can't stop me, so who gon' stop me? You can't stop me, so who gon' stop me? We be disturbing the peace, working we serving the streets, about to go ahead going beast, bang bang leave you sleep. No, oh, we're getting a little off track. Me, like, shut the fuck up. But, but you call yourself a turtle. A turtle. Do you know what that means? A turtle. Guess what? Turtle boy, you fucking turtle. Right? Go get a new name, okay? You fucking turtle dude. Okay, no, you don't because you're a fucking loser. My name's Are Aiden. Parents or Aiden. Aiden, you, you can call me parents. Aiden. You can call me doctor. No, but... I don't want to call you. I want to call you a dickhead because that's what you are. Okay this one thing this is one thing i've ever want i've always wanted to ask you where's your award How? your award-winning journalist where's that award hey where's your award turtle douche all right what's up people how's everyone doing out there good good excellent welcome to the live show ladies and gentlemen i am your fearless host they call me my name's aiden uh but some people call me clarence woods emerson uh, others call me Uncle Turtle Boy, old school turtle riders. I prefer doctor. That's my Twitter handle because if Jill Biden's a doctor, so am I. That's at D O C T O R Turtle Boy. Or uh, you can, some have called me daddy. Uh, you know, maybe that's your thing. Maybe it's not. You're definitely not required to call me daddy. Um, but if you'd like to, you can. Whatever you want to call me. I don't care what you call me. Just be here every Tuesday and Saturday night at. 9 p.m. That's all I ask for, for the live show. And make sure you smash that subscribe button. Give us a big thumbs up. All right. And if you if you really like Turtle Boy, you could join Turtle Club for just $15 a month. You get ad free on the websites. You also get access to the Thursday stream that no one else gets. We call it the sex cult. I am Brian Tully's daddy. That's true. I am Brian Tully's daddy. So I got that going for me. So um and it said that on my mugshot. So, you know, that kind of is my name at this point. So 
it's pretty accurate. All right, we already got 2,000 people over here on YouTube. Nice to see. Uh, we got, uh, what do we got over here on the Twitter? We got 800 people on Twitter, so that's cool. Uh, we got some rumble rats too. How many rumble rats we got? We got, uh, hold on. Let's see how many rumble rats we have. We've got 95 of you people. Shout out to the rumble rats. Spammy says Bev was a big douche canoe today. That she was, that she was, we knew she wasn't going to dismiss it. We're going to talk all about that. Man, she was extra cunty today, wasn't she? What was in her snatch today? She was really upset. Vinny loved. Oh, <laughs> that crusty panties lost her mind today on Vinny's thing. That was that was funny to watch. But anyway, guys, uh, yeah. What else was I going to see? Oh, if you like the program and you'd like to support us, right? What you can do is you can click at the link at the top for Turtle Chat, and you can donate whatever amount of money you want. And when that happens, I will get a notification on my email and you get to write a little message and I'll read your message out loud to the class. All right. Also, you can cash at me at dollar sign Uncle Turtle Boy. You can do it that way. And I will get it on my phone and I'll read off. Like, so for instance, what do we got here? We already got cash app here from. All right. The Notorious NIP. The Notorious NIP is back and says, for when you long D, when you run long D, do you put band-aids on your nips? I think long distance. Uh, no, I don't put band-aids on my nips. Uh, my, my nips are nothing special. Thank you, Notorious NIP. Ron Vice sends 10 bucks and says, never explored JA being behind BA during dong dial. Who's JA? Julie Albert? Being behind Brian Albert? I don't get it. Okay, thank you, Ron. Uh, Jim Ferris Bueller sends five bucks and says, were you Randy when Chinaman J-O'd in cell next to you? Oh, for fuck's sake. The Chinese. <laughs> no, I was, I was, I was, I thought it was funny. It was pretty weird though. Mark sends 10 bucks and goes, shout out to my homeboy, Tommy D. Tommy B, rather. Shout out to his homeboy, Tommy D be okay um so let's see here do we have any tur uh, turtle chats okay no turtle is it working okay cool again if anyone else wants to donate click at the link at the top for turtle chat you can do it that way or you can cash at me at dollar sign uncle turtle boy and uh we'll be good to go okay cool um i'm in a tanning booth yeah the, the lights are bright here some people say that but i don't know uh all right, cool. Let's just jump right into it. So we'll play some of the stuff from court today, but first we need to read Auntie Bev's stupid. She, it's not getting dismissed. It's not getting dismissed. We're going to have a trial, guys. We're going to have a trial. And I don't know about you guys, but I am ready to fuck. Let's go. Let's go. Daddy's Rudy. Let's go. So we are, uh, we're, we're going to do this and I can't wait for the trial. I mean, the self, you know, I said for a while that I don't want a trial because it's not fair to can't read. And I totally get that. But at the same time, like it's going to be awesome and it's going to be just wild and it's going to benefit me, obviously, because uh, what you call it, uh, all these assholes who I'm being charged with, you know, intimidating are all going to have to take the stand. They're all going to have to take the stand and they're going to have to answer a lot of questions. Like, and I don't think Proctor's going to do too well. And I don't think, uh, I don't know what Gemma cave is going to say a lot of stuff. So anyway, uh, so let's read this, shall we? Does the courthouse have it? We'll, we'll talk about the protest too, but we need to read this motion to dismiss. Okay. Let's start from the top. All righty. How can I make this? Can I get rid of this thing? Oh, I like that. Okay, cool. All right. So they want to file it with an Odell motion uh, to get or dismiss it with an Odell motion. All right. So it's denied and they'll explain why. All right. So they do the background and even the background was a little biased, I thought. So they go to the waterfall, blah, blah, blah. 
She drove O'Keefe home to Brian Albert's house where they were meeting. The snow was falling. The defendant was distraught because because he hadn't come home yet. Right. And uh, and was not answering his cell phone. Jim McCabe heard the defendant screaming, John didn't come home. We had a fight. I left him at the waterfall. And this is grand jury transcript from Jennifer McCabe. That's my first time seeing that. Uh, Jennifer McCabe told the grand jury, apparently, that John, that Karen said was screaming. John didn't come home. We had a fight. I left him at the waterfall. Wait, she left him at the waterfall. Did she say that? Man, that seems odd. That seems odd. Um, but anyway, at around 5 a.m., the defendant called Carrie Roberts, whose husband is friends with O'Keefe. The defendant was hysterical and she screamed, John's dead, and then hung up. Did she really say that at 5 a.m.? I don't know. All right. Um, and that is also grand jury testimony from Carrie Roberts. She called Roberts back and told her that John O'Keefe had not come home. During their conversation, she stated something must have happened to him. What if he's dead? Uh, what if a plow hit him? So even if she did say that, what, like, it's like, what are you thinking? If you're her, aren't you worried that he's not alive? Like, wouldn't that be a natural thing? Like, where is he? He's of course you're worried. Like, I hope he's okay. Did he get hit by a plow? Like her mind is notice what she's not saying is I hit him. The defendant also stated, I don't remember anything from last night. We drank so much. I don't remember anything. The defendant McCabe and Roberts went to look for O'Keefe together at the Albert residence. While on their way there, the defendant wondered out loud whether she could have hit O'Keefe with her car, according to John McCabe, and mentioned that she had a crack in her taillight. Shortly after 6 a.m., they arrived at the Albert residence where the defendant, sp defendant spotted O'Keefe lying in the front yard covered in snow, or covered in snow, and unresponsive. When the paramedics arrived and asked what happened, the defendant was hysterical and inconsolable and repeatedly stated, I hit him. I hit him. According to, to the woman who is went on spring break with Caitlin Albert, that, that is what the hearsay is from that woman, Katie McLaughlin. The paramedics transported O'Keefe to the hospital where he's pronounced dead. The medical examiner ruled the cause of death as blunt impact injuries of the head and hypothermia. She did not see any obvious signs of an altercation or fight. Oh, really? Except for the fact that his freaking hands were black and blue. His wrist, like right where you punch somebody. That part was black and blue. He had a gash in the back of his head and he had black eyes. But besides that, there was no signs of a fight. I mean, are you abs or are you kidding me? And I think, I don't know if it's Melanie Little that always points this out. It's like, why are they telling you what didn't happen? No, well, th there was no fight. No, no, there was no fight. Why is she saying that? That seems like an odd thing to say. During the subsequent police investigation, officers discovered taillight and broken cocktail at the scene, except they didn't, Auntie Bev. So this is Auntie Bev's rework. And remember, she didn't know who Higgins was till five minutes ago. According to Auntie Bev, during the subsequent police investigation, officers discovered pieces of taillight and a broken cocktail glass at the scene. Except they didn't. Except they didn't. Except the Canton police found broken pieces of cocktail glass. And the other guys didn't. I apologize. The, the other guys are the ones, the state police are the ones that found the red taillight. So the camp police found no taillight. They're acting, she's acting like they found this all together. See the way she wrote this up? Does she even know the facts of the case? They discovered pieces of taillight in a broken cocktail glass at the scene. They seized the defendant's vehicle. At what time? Now we're talking like 10 hours later, which had a shattered rear taillight and scratches on the bumper. No, it didn't. There's pictures of that video, uh, pictures of that goddamn videos of the car. The car did not have a shattered taillight. Stop it. Stop it. A forensic toxol uh, let's see. A forensic toxicologist opined the defendant's uh, that her blood alcohol level 
must have been between 0.13 to 0.29, which is a pretty big range. Police officers spoke with people who were present at the Albert residence who all reported that they did not see O'Keefe and that he never entered the residence. The Norfolk Advocates for Children interviewed O'Keefe's niece and nephew who lived with them. They stated the defendant and O'Keefe argued frequently. They both described a recent uh, argument within two weeks of O'Keefe's death where he had asked the defendant to leave his house, but she refused to leave. His niece described a second argument within a week of his death where she heard O'Keefe tell the defendant that he wanted to end the relationship. It run its course. It was not healthy and that they argued too often. The defendant did not want the relationship to end and again refused to leave the house. Officers also recovered texts exchanged between the defendant and O'Keefe on January 28th and voicemails left after 1 a.m., uh, leading up to the night of the waterfall, the defendant and O'Keefe exchanged several texts about their relationship, which was strained in the voicemails that the defendant left O'Keefe. She stated, quote, you are, see, these are new quotes. I haven't seen these quotes yet. You are, you are fucking using me right now. You are fucking another girl. You are a fucking loser. Fuck yourself. And then she called him a fucking pervert. Oh, you better hope if I end up dead, I know exactly who's going to jail for me. <laughs> it's like, but this, come on. Uh, so like she said, she obviously said this stuff because it's on a voicemail, right? You are fucking using me right now. You are fucking another girl. You are a fucking loser. Fuck yourself. A fucking pervert. Look at, look at, I don't, people are going to look at this and be like, oh wow, she's a crazy bitch. Whatever. Okay. Again. We don't know the details of a relationship. We don't know how these people are, you know, reading that stuff. I'm like, you know, I'm glad we're just friends, <laughs> but like at the same time, like that doesn't make you like um, any, you better hope your spouse doesn't like end up dead under, you know, sh shady circumstances. They go through your phone. They find some shit like that. You're going to jail. Like doesn't matter if there's no evidence. They, that's all they need is those messages. And it's like, just cause you have messages like that doesn't make you a killer. Stop it. Exactly. I don't care what words she said. I don't care what words she said. Yeah. Like if this was all part of a bigger package where like she said all that stuff and then there was like actual evidence showing that she did this and not a substantial amount of evidence suggesting that she didn't do this. Come on. Then it maybe it would matter, but it doesn't. Who doesn't leave messages like that? I mean, yeah. I mean, a lot of people have a lot of people have, she called them a fucking pervert and she yelled, John, I fucking hate you. Now keep in mind, she thinks he's fucking someone else. Let's not underestimate that. She thinks he's fucking someone else. Now, if she had just killed him, why would she leave such incriminating voicemails? Like they'd be like, Oh wow, this bitch really hates him. Huh? No, she would do the exact opposite. She would do the exact opposite. He did fuck someone else. I don't really care who he fucked. I don't care who any of these people fucked. None of my business. Believe me. All right. So the legal standard. Okay. We'll skip all this stuff. The defendant must establish that the Commonwealth knowingly or recklessly presented false or deceptive evidence to the grand jury, that the evidence was presented for the purpose of obtaining an indictment and the evidence probably influenced the grand jury's decision to indict. All right. So let's see if they did that. In certain instances, the failure to disclose known information may impair the grand jury proceedings. All right. Um, okay, we're going to skip all this. All right, discussion. As noted above, the defendant maintains that the Commonwealth knowingly and recklessly presented false and deceptive evidence to the grand jury and withheld exculpatory evidence for the purpose of obtaining the indictments. The defendant also maintains the Commonwealth deliberately admitted inadmissible evidence to secure the indictments. The court addresses each of them for dismissal. So starting with Lank, the defendant argues that Sergeant Lank, who is one of the first officers to arrive at the scene on the morning of January 29th, gave false and deceptive testimony to the grand jury and withheld evidence of his personal relationship with the Albert family. Specifically, the defendant contends that the Commonwealth and Lank gave false and deceptive testimony to the grand jury regarding purported admissions made by the defendant. 
that they gave deceptive testimony as to the reason the state police took over the investigation from the Canton Police Department and that they withheld exculpatory information as to Sergeant Link's longstanding relationship with the Albert family. With respect to the first argument, this is what this is what Lank told the grand jury. This is what he said to the grand jury. He said, so officers that were there prior to my arrival had attempted to speak with Reed, but from what I had gathered from them, she was too hysterical and was unable to really assist us in any way. The only information they were able to retrieve from her is that she could not recall whether or not she had been there. Uh, the defendant contends that this testimony impaired the grand jury proceedings because it was not based on personal observations. It distorted the defendant's statements to the responding officers and strongly suggested an admission of guilt. After careful review, this does not meet the standard for dismissal. To establish that the Commonwealth impaired the integrity of the grand jury, the defendant must first demonstrate the false and deceptive evidence was given to the grand jury knowingly or with reckless disregard for the truth. Nothing before the court suggests that Lank gave knowingly false testimony to the grand jury or that he sought to deceive. Okay. Lank clearly stated that his knowledge of the defendant on the morning of January 29th came from what he had gathered from other officers who speak with Reed, uh, not his personal observations. Uh, moreover, although uh, other evidence presented to the grand jury demonstrates that the officers on scene obtained more information from the defendant than that stated by Sergeant Lank, nothing before the court demonstrates that those officers communicated that information to Lank or that he purposely withheld it from the grand jury. Again, I haven't read their entire motion to dismiss, so I don't even know everything that they claimed. Isn't that hearsay? A lot of it is, but she's going to explain why it why she doesn't think it matters. All right. Even if Lank knowingly or recklessly gave a false statement to the grand jury, the defendant hasn't established that the Commonwealth presented Sergeant Lank's testimony for the purpose of obtaining the indictment or that it probably influenced the grand jury's decision to indict. Okay. So she's conceding here that like, even if Lank lied, even if he gave a false statement, they haven't established that Lank's testimony, false testimony, was for the purpose of obtaining the indictment. Well, then what else could it be for? What else is the purpose of this grand jury other than to indict someone for a crime? <laughs> what am I missing here? Is that not the purpose of the indictment? Okay. But going on, it states... Uh, prior to Lank's testimony, the three police officers who were first on the scene testified before the grand jury as to their firsthand observations of the defendant and statements she made. Cam police officer Stephen Seraf described the defendant as very, very distraught and very upset. She kept loudly and hysterically saying, this is my fault. I can't believe this happened. By the way, neither of those, this is my fault. I can't believe this happened is an admission that she hit him. Think about that. Like if you say, this is my fault, it's my fault. I dropped him off there. I let him go inside. I should have told him to come home. I should have put my foot down and say, we're not going out tonight, John. Or I can't believe this happened. What's this? I can't believe he's dead. Like I can't believe he's here right now on the ground dying. So neither of those to me is an admission of guilt. Goes on to say, and then she asked several times if O'Keefe was going to die. Can't so again. This is a woman who supposedly is like the mastermind. And Jen McCabe, what was she doing this whole time? We'll see when we see the dash cam videos. Which I don't know anything about any dash cam videos, but I bet you she's pretty suspicious on those dash cam videos. And I'm really anxious to see him for the first time. I've never seen him before because I don't know anything about any dash cam videos. All right, back to this. Officer Good asked the defendant how O'Keefe ended up outside the residence, and she stated, I don't know. He asked if she drove O'Keefe there the night before, and she stated, I think so. And then, I can't remember. He stopped asking questions because she was too upset and unable to keep a train of thought. Given the preceding testimony of these officers, it is highly unlikely the Commonwealth sought to deceive 
the grand jurors into thinking the only information officers could gather from the defendant was that she did not remember whether or not she had been to the Albert residence. For the same reason, it is equally unlikely that Lang's testimony made a difference in the grand jury's decision to indict the defendant. So basically she's saying that, well, it's not just Lang, it's all these other cops through that said, you know, who testified as to what they said. All right, what's Nick Rocco saying here? 412, we will hear everything the defense wants submitted to trial. A lot of Fed info coming. See, Nick Rocco knows more than me now. He's more in the know. You might have seen him in court today. He sits with the family now. I don't know if you guys noticed that. He's a big shot. Uh, I'm all, I'm cut off. <laughs> I'm cut off because I was on the news when I was in jail because like 189 phone calls. I thought it would be more than that, to be perfectly honest with you. 189 phone calls. But uh, yeah, so anything Nick Rocco says, interesting. He says that there's uh, that if everything the defense wants submitted into trial, meaning a lot of the Fed info, is coming. I didn't even know there was another hearing on the 12th. Okay. All right. Let's see. Is there court Thursday? This Thursday? Why would there be? Not too sure. All right. State police involvement. Uh, the defendant also argues that Sergeant Lank gave deceptive testimony as to the reason the state police took over the investigation from the Canada Police Department. Specifically, the defendant contends Lank's testimony uh, that the state police assumed jurisdiction and took over the investigation as soon as as soon as it was determined that O'Keefe was deceased. It was an effort to conceal the fact that the Canada Police lost jurisdiction in the case because their agency was conflicted. So Lank gave deceptive testimony as to the reason the state police took over. Okay. All right. So basically they're saying here that Lank lied about the reason the state police took over. It wasn't simply that he was dead. It was that the department itself was conflicted out largely because Kevin Albert uh, is a member of the Albert family. The defendant hasn't shown that Lank's testimony in this regard was false or deceptive or that he withheld exculpatory evidence. His testimony as to the reason the state police took over the investigation is consistent uh, with whatever, which requires that the Norfolk DA's office and its law enforcement representative direct and control an investigation of a death that occurs under the circumstances presented by this case. Okay. And shall coordinate the investigation with the office of the chief medical examiner, blah, 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 blah. The defendant has not put forth any evidence that suggests the state police took over the investigation for some other reason. The defendant refers only to a, ah, see this, this, read this one. This is the first thing I took issue with with Auntie Bev. All right. So it says here, the defendant hasn't put forth any evidence that suggests the state police took over the investigation for some other reason the defendant refers only to a boston globe article wherein norfolk county district attorney michael morrissey is quoted as saying that the can police department recognized a potential conflict early on and recused itself from the case so the can put like they recused themselves because they this is what morrissey told the boston globe he's quoted as saying this but that's not enough for Auntie Bev. She goes, this article is neither competent evidence that the court can rely upon for purposes of this motion, nor does it lead to the conclusion that Lank falsely testified that the state police took over the investigation. Moreover, because the state police directed and controlled the investigation and the Canton police officers testified only as their involvement when his body was discovered, it is unlikely that if the grand jurors had known the Canton police had a conflict in connection with the investigation, it would have had any impact on their decision to indict. So she's saying that this quote, the literally a quote from Michael Morrissey in the Boston Globe, in which he says that the Canton police department recognized a potential conflict and recused itself. Somehow that's not enough. Somehow a direct quote from Michael Morrissey is not enough. I don't, what else does she want? Okay, Auntie Bev, relax. Relation, uh, give me one second. Uh, hold on, let me get a bit of straw. I'm sick of this straw.
That's better. All right. Much better. Okay. The defendant contends the Commonwealth intentionally withheld exculpatory information that Lank had a longstanding relationship with members of the Albert family and that he had in the past deputized himself to shield them from liability. In support of this argument, the defendant cites a complaint in a civil action against Lank regarding an incident that occurred. This is the Lapalato brothers thing that I wrote about where Lank, while off duty, allegedly physically assaulted two individuals and had one arrested after they had an altercation with Tim Albert. It's actually Chris Albert. Auntie Bev. The case later settled. According to the defendant, the Commonwealth's failure to disclose this information impaired the integrity of the grand jury proceedings because the juror, uh, because had the grand jurors known of this incident, it would have undermined his credibility. The court is not persuaded. The Commonwealth's obligation is to present exculpatory evidence that would greatly undermine the credibility of an important witness or evidence likely to affect the grand jury's decision as well as evidence, the withholding of which could cause the presentation to be seriously tainted. The defendant has not directed this court to any case law that suggests allegations in a civil complaint from 20 years ago against one of the many police officers preliminarily involved in the investigation would be considered exculpatory evidence. Um, her reasoning is that nor is there any evidence before the court that Link engaged in conduct during his brief involvement with this case that suggests that he was not impartial. Even if knowing Lank had a history of friendship with Brian Albert's brother may have colored the grand jurors view of this testimony. Lank was one of many cops who testified and his role in the investigation was minimal. His role wasn't minimal though. Lank's role was not minimal. He got, he was the one who Jen McCabe called at eight 38 and said, come on back to the house. I got something to tell you. And he went back over there, even though the state police had taken over. And she told him that that's when she told Lank, oh yeah, Karen Reed said a whole bunch of really shady shit. Like, oh, did could I have hit him? Did I hit him? All this stuff. Lank did go inside the house. He's the only one. He was the only one on the scene that stepped foot inside that residence. But he didn't do anything. Like he didn't look around. He didn't take pictures, nothing. He just went in there. He saw his old buddy, Brian Albert. And then he just, we don't know what happened. We don't know what happened. He's got the fuck out of there. All right. Um, his entire testimony makes up only 27 pages of the grand jury transcript, which is over 1,400 pages in length. Given the extensive amount of other evidence against the defendant, it is unlikely that this information would have affected the grand jury's decision to indict. To the extent the defendant contends that the Alberts did not come out of their residence at the time O'Keefe's body was discovered because they were waiting for their friend, Sergeant Lank, to interview them, that assertion is purely conjecture. They don't think that the Alberts are shady for, they don't know. She's got this all mixed up. To the extent the defendant contends the Alberts did not come to, out of the residence at the time O'Keefe's body was discovered because they were waiting for their friend Sergeant Lank. No, that's not why we didn't think they could. They didn't come out because because they're probably he probably had fucking bruises or some shit. That these two are unrelated. Like Lank came hours later. Does she even know the facts of this case? I don't know. Uh, it says their testimony for the grand jury was that Brian Albert and his wife, Nicole were sleeping during the early morning hours when the body was discovered. So they weren't fucking anymore. They were sleeping after a long night of fucking and butt dialing. Well, how about trooper Proctor, the defendant argues that state police trooper, Michael Proctor gave false and deceptive testimony to the grand jury and failed to disclose. He had a personal relationship with other witnesses specifically the defendant contends that trooper Proctor withheld from the grand jury that Proctor is a close family friend of the Alberts. They failed to inform the grand jury. There was an alternate explanation for the defendant's broken taillight and they withheld from the grand jury that the death certificate stated that the manner of death could not be determined. 
So relationship with the Albert. With respect to the first argument, the defendant has proffered evidence that shows Trooper Proctor's sister was friends with Jennifer McCabe. Jennifer McCabe? I don't even think I've seen that. The Proctor, I've never seen any pictures of Courtney Proctor and Jennifer McCabe. I don't know about you guys. She's got it all mixed up. And Julie and Chris Albert, definitely. The brother and sister-in-law of Brian Albert. Even assuming Proctor had a personal relationship with these witnesses, disclosure to the grand jury was not necessarily required. How? How? How is that not required? You don't have to mention that you're like good friends with the people who were the key witnesses in the case. I don't know about that. Doesn't seem right. Doesn't seem right to me. Even assuming Proctor had a relationship, assuming had a personal relationship with these witnesses, disclosure to the grand jury was not necessarily required. Only when the prosecutor possesses evidence, which would greatly undermine the credibility of evidence likely to affect the grand jury's decision to indict, must he alert the grand jury to the existence of such evidence. When the prosecutor possesses evidence, which would greatly undermine the credibility of, of evidence. What? Likely to affect the grand jury's decision to indict. Must he alert the grand jury to the existence of such evidence? I feel like that would, I feel like evidence that Michael Proctor knows them would affect the grand jury's decision to indict. I, I feel that. I don't know. Just seems right. Anyway, um, the defendant has not pointed to any case law that suggests a police officer's credibility is greatly undermined if he knows witnesses in a case. Are you fucking kidding me? She actually wrote that? They haven't found case law that suggests a cop's credibility is greatly undermined if he knows witnesses in a case. How about just like common sense? You need case law to tell you that? That you're, you know... It's a conflict if you know everybody involved. You really need like something versus something to tell you that that ain't right. I mean, I didn't go to law school, but I know that ain't right. That you can't know, you can't be best friends with the witnesses. You can't have your mom posting on Facebook. The Alberts are a second family. I mean, Jesus Christ. And they have number five here. Let's see. These are the footnotes to the extent the defendant argues Proctor's relationship with these and other witnesses is closer than what is shown in the evidence before the court. Such an issue is properly dealt with at trial on cross-examination. So I saw a, an attorney, his name is rich. Uh, he was posting on Twitter about this today and he thinks, let me just read Rich's tweet. He had a good tweet about this. Give me one moment. Oh, where the fuck did, who sent it to me? Oh, hey, I got it. Let me pull it up. All right, this is what he said about that. He's a lawyer. He says, Judge Canoni concedes there are several examples of Proctor's professional and questionable conduct. If she believes so, you can bet the defense will be throttling Proctor on the stand and may have a motion to exclude evidence ready for his testimony. So it sounds like she's kind of given him the green light like this footnote is giving the okay you could tear him apart across examination if you want and i can't wait i can't wait for this shit. you know how long we've been waiting for this for i thought we were going to get this on may 25th for the evidentiary hearing i was really looking forward to that hearing really looking forward to that hearing and then auntie bev canceled it the day before unbelievable like we were going to hear from these people. And then she just canceled the evidentiary hearing. Well, now, now you can't hide. Now you can't leave. Michael Proctor is going to take that stand. What are they thinking people? I mean, what are we? I tweeted this out today. What is Michael Morrissey thinking? Do they not realize what a freaking epic clown show this is going to be? I mean, it's going to be great theater, 
Michael Proctor on the stand is going to get fucking destroyed. You know, like all like these people, I'm with you, Glare. Like these people are not going to do well with the bright lights when they're up there. And Alan Jackson's got his watch on and his tightly tailored suit. And he's up there doing this thing. He always does that. And he just was meticulous. Like you saw what Alan Jackson did to that uh, Heather Unruh's husband. Remember how she got him all flustered? Remember that one? That was good. But uh, he's going to just destroy Proctor. Proctor's not going to do well up there. He's going to try to act all professional. He's gonna, first of all, he's under internal affairs investigation. Have have you ever? I t- talked about this on Harry today. Have you ever heard of this happening before? Of the lead detective in a murder investigation who is under investigation himself at the time of trial? Because that's going to come up. <laughs> that's going to come up. And ha- first of all, they're going to pick twelve jurors. They get a Good luck finding 12 people in Norfolk County who have never heard of this case before. But they're going to get 12 people, presumably who don't know much about this, and they're going to see on the stand, and they're going to be like, what's up with these pictures? So you didn't know them, huh? Dude, How? what juror is going to believe Michael Proctor didn't know these people? No one's going to believe that. The second you hear that, you, they're just like, oh. Well, that, that's it. So this guy's in charge of the investigation. So that's how there's a conspiracy. The guy in charge of the whole fucking thing is best friends with these people. And they're going to know he's a liar. He's going to have to admit that he lied to the state grand jury to get this guy indicted. It's going to have to come up. People don't like lying cops. Who picks the jury? They both do. It's a, it's a process. They both get to eliminate some. Yeah, the, the, you're going to see this, Lauren. No joke. Imagine Proctor pleading the fifth during cross examination. You don't think we're going to see wit- witnesses for the state are going to have to plead the fifth? It's just going to be wild. It's going to wild. I mean, Walsh could walk. <laughs> it's like imagine that if things go badly for Proctor. Yeah. Anyway, back to this. Um, and then the second court uh, footnote says. The court notes there is an ongoing federal inquiry into the investigation of O'Keefe's death. And the state police is also currently investigating Trooper Proctor. The Commonwealth and the defendant have received numerous documents regarding the federal investigation pursuant to a TUI request. And the defendant cites several documents as evidence of a longstanding compromising relationship between Proctor and the Alberts. The court has reviewed all the documents from the federal investigation. And while they reveal several examples of Trooper Proctor's unprofessional and questionable conduct. Ooh. Ooh. They do not shed much light on the extent of his relationship with the witnesses and what impact, if any, the relationships had on his... Are you fucking kidding me? I mean, is that a joke? They don't shed much light on the extent of the relationship with the witnesses. He's texting them asking for a babysitter. They're offering him bribes. He's conflict. Exactly. Oh, wait. Well, no, I don't even think he was. Oh, I definitely think he's a bad guy. I disagree with that one. So, um, he's a horrible guy. I mean, what kind of guy does something like this? I mean, so they don't have, it's what the mere fact that a conflict exists is all you need to know. Anyway, even if Proctor's familiar familiarity with the witnesses suggests some sort of bias in the investigation that the grand jury may have considered to warrant dismissal, the defendant must show that the absence of the withheld evidence likely would have affected the grand jury's decision to indict. If I was on the grand jury, that would affect me very much. I'm just saying, if you were to tell me, oh yeah, this guy left out the part where he's known these people for quite some time and then didn't treat them as suspects 
or really question them, especially Colin Albert, who was just not questioned, you know, for 18 months. Yeah, that's, uh, uh, that would affect me. The grand jury heard extensive evidence supporting probable cause to believe the defendant struck O'Keefe with their vehicle. Therefore, even if the grand jury had been aware of Proctor's relationship with the Alberts, it would almost certainly have le left unaltered the disposition to indict. Okay. Uh, turning to the sure thing, Auntie Beth. Turning to the second argument, Proctor testified that the state police viewed footage from the ring camera at O'Keefe's residence, including one camera located above the garage doors. The Commonwealth showed the grand jury the video, and Trooper Proctor testified as to what he saw. He stated that at 5.07, the defendant is seen reversing out of the garage and driving off. As she backed out of the garage, her right rear taillight came extremely close to Mr. O'Keefe's SUV. It didn't come extremely close. It hit it. It hit the SUV. It's undeniable. Do we have a footnote here? I have footnote six. It says, Sergeant Buchanan's testimony, the defendant also argues the Commonwealth intentionally misled the grand jury as to Proctor's relationship with Julie and Chris Albert. Buchanan read to the grand jury his report of the interview he conducted with Proctor of Chris and Julie Albert. The report began with the words, following formal introductions. The court does not agree that this testimony was intentionally misleading. Buchanan wrote the report, and there's no suggestion that he knew either of the witnesses or used this language to misrepresent Proctor's connection to Chris and Julie Albert. So they're blaming Proctor. They're blaming Proctor. Okay. Anyway, uh, the court also does not agree with the defendant's argument in her supplemental memorandum that the Commonwealth withheld evidence of Buchanan's pre-existing relationship with another witness, Brian Higgins, because Buchanan and Higgins had drinks socialized at the gym. I did not know this. So Higgins and Buchanan are buddies and it worked on a couple cases together. The defendant's supplemental memorandum for the same reason the court has concluded Proctor's alleged pre-existing relationship with some witnesses does not warrant dismissal of the indictment. It concludes Buchanan's familiarity with Higgins does not warrant dismissal. Okay. Anyway, no pieces of taillight were viewed anywhere in the driveway that day, and no damage was observed anywhere on O'Keefe's SUV. They love to say that. Like, why would there be taillight? Like, there wouldn't necessarily, taillight wouldn't shatter. I mean, it, it might crack. It's not going to shatter. Stop it. The defendant argues that his testimony was misleading because her vehicle did strike the SUV, breaking her taillight. It did, thus providing an alternative explanation to the theory of the broken taillight. Nothing about Proctor's testimony was misleading. The Commonwealth was not obligated to offer an alternative explanation, alternate explanation for the broken taillight, but he lied. Wait, nor does the fact that the defendant has a different interpretation of the video. It's not a different interpretation of the video. It's just a fact. We've all seen that video. In slow motion, she hits the car. It's undeniable. The car moves. It's undeniable that she hits the car. It's not a different interpretation. It's Proctor lied. Moreover, the ring video was introduced into evidence before the grand jury, allowing the grand jury to assess whether the defendant's vehicle made contact with O'Keefe's SUV. Accordingly, there is no merit to the defense argument that Proctor's testimony impaired the process. Okay. O'Keefe's death certificate. The defendant lastly contends that the Commonwealth attempted to deceive the grand jury with its presentation of evidence regarding O'Keefe's death certificate. Uh, and yeah, let me read a couple of these. Yeah. One more. Uh, during the proceedings, Proctor testified that the cause of death listed on the death certificate was blunt impact injuries of head and hypothermia. He was not asked and therefore did not testify that the death certificate listed the manner of death as could not be determined. According to the defendant, like Odell, 
The Commonwealth distorted the evidence by only presenting a portion of the information from the death certificate. This too is unavailing. So again, Proctor testified the cause of death on the death certificate was blunt impact injuries of head and hypothermia. He did not testify that the death certificate listed the manner of death as could not be determined. Okay. The circumstances here are markedly different than Odell. In Odell, a police detective read the grand jury an edited version of the defendant's statement to police in the aftermath of an armed robbery. As edited, the statement suggested an admission of guilt by silence when, in fact, the defendant had claimed, had disclaimed any knowledge of the robbery to police. The Supreme District, the SJC, held the omission of part of the defendant's statement was not a mere withholding of exculpatory evidence, but tended to distort the meaning, uh, blah, 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 blah. Here, unlike Odell, admitting that the manner of death could not be determined did not tend to distort the meaning of the cause of death. This information shed no light on the cause of death, uh, blah, 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 nor does it inculpate or exculpate the defendant. Moreover, because the death certificate was submitted to the grand jury. Okay. I don't really get this part. Do you guys get this part? I, I, I don't understand. Like, so... I don't know. I'm not a big fan of this argument. Do you guys understand this one? Maybe somebody can explain this one to me. Let me read the comments. Now I see. Let's see. I don't know. Yeah, I don't think anybody gives a shit. Okay. Again, I, I don't, this is not the most, conv I don't get this part. So I'm just going to skip that part. Actually, I'm going to be right back. I just got to get a water. Hold on. I'm, I'm thirsty tonight, guys. All right. So let me, uh, before we go any further, let me read some turtle chats real quick. We got a couple turtle chats to read here. All right. Um, all right. We got Bukaki's sweaty shirt sends 10 bucks and says Vill Vinny Politan needs to vet his guests better and their underwear. Wait, who's his guest? Who's his guest? What are you talking about? He needs to vet his guests better. Okay, I don't know. Next, Liz sends 25 bucks and says, so you think Bev has the hots for Lunchbox? Uh, I don't think so. Uh, I don't, I don't know. I don't think anyone has the hots for Lunchbox. Thank you, Liz. Uh, Lisa sends 10 bucks, says, Mrs. Miss Reed showed us what true, Mr. Reed showed us what true humanity looks like. Glad to be on the side of good versus evil. He was fantastic outside of court today. He was great. Mike sends 25 and says, what do you think Karen's lawyers are up to with their strategy uh, not to pursue the extraordinary misconduct? Okay, so what I think of that uh, is that I think that they are simply holding their cards in, that they are waiting till trial to they, – they're sitting on some juicy shit, but like they really – that Bev wasn't going to dismiss it anyway. So why show their cards now when they, and all that does is give them a chance to kind of, um, you know, come up with a lie. That's traditionally what happened. So that's what I think of that. Thank you, Mike. Kim C sends 25 bucks and says, watching Karen's hearings with you live is a gift. I did not know I needed. Please keep up with the commentary. At least you are safe, and it's my favorite thing. Thank you again for everything you do. Yeah, I mean, I like doing the streams. I get a lot of views when I do these streams. They're pretty cool. I'd rather be there. I'm not going to be honest. I mean, that was my thing. I'd rather be at the courthouse. Obviously, my stalker didn't show up today, so, uh, you know, I could have gone, but I don't know. I'd rather I, – I refuse to be ejected again. I'm, I refuse to be in that situation, so um, – We'll see. We'll see. You know, we'll, hopefully we'll get it fixed before the trial because I need to be at the trial and uh, it's going to be awesome. Okay. All right. Um, other comments. Let me see. Comments. 
Uh, Diane sends 40 bucks and said, I heard you on Howie this afternoon. Awesome. A team up with Howie sounds like a home run for you both. Yeah. I'm like a regular on, I would describe myself as a regular on Howie car. Now somebody's telling me today, they go watch Howie's definitely going to ask you to come on now. 430. I got the text. You want to come on? Like when I'm like, kind of like the go-to cons the, I'm like the Karen Reed consultant for Howie car. Whenever something happens in there, like I know I'm going to get the con the call from him. Come on. And it's good to have. So, um, all right, next. Thank you, Diane. Uh, Charmaine sends 10 bucks and says, how much more of this BS do we have to see here and read before Bev and all the other cronies go down too much wasted time for Karen Reed, her family and the system. You're absolutely right. Charmaine completely agree with you there. Suzanne sends 35 bucks and says, happy birthday, Brendan. As always, thank you so much for all that you do. Well, thank you very much, Stan. Happy birthday, Brendan. Julie sends 10 bucks and says, is Auntie Bev allowing this to go to trial because she wants to be famous? That's what I said. That's what I said. I think she wants to be famous. In my opinion, the defense will wipe the floor. Uh, do you think she is being paid to make these rulings? Good grief. No, I just think she's lazy. She doesn't, I think she's extremely lazy. Like she got the name Tim Albert wrong in this stupid motion. Like she didn't know who Higgins was. I just think she's lazy. Okay. Olivia and I are smart. So she says the manner of death and the death certificate is so relevant because manner could have been homicide versus accident. The MOD being undetermined to be a homicide makes it hard to charge with murder. Because I heard there's two death certificates. The first one said undetermined, could not be determined cause of death. And the other one said the more incriminating thing. And I think that's the one they presented, I'm pretty sure. So thank you for answering that question. Thank you. All right. Uh, do we have another turtle chat here? It's got to bang through. Hold on. Where'd they go? They're there. Uh uh, 50 bucks from Samantha said, what happened to make Yanetti not available today? I think it was a personal conflict. Bev was being such a cunt to Jackson for being on zoom. It was so aggressive. I know she was such a cunt to him today. And it's like, she wanted him. To, remember? She's like, you can come on zoom. You can, you can come on zoom. So, uh, kind of like the two can police reports. Second one being more incriminating. Exactly. All right. Um, okay. Let's read some more. Sean sends 10 bucks. It says, I think the feds step in before the trial begins. I wonder what the feds are thinking. Are they amazed that Auntie Bev didn't dismiss the charges? I think they might be a little bit. I think they're expecting her to just dismiss these. But we don't know what they're holding. Again, I still go back to David Yanetti's statement about the feds told them that they can't in good conscience allow this to go to trial, which means they know that Karen Reed is innocent, which means that they just assume this would be dropped by the judge, but it's not. So maybe it's time they need to arrest someone. That's the only way this doesn't go to trial guys is if somebody gets arrested, somebody gets indicted. Like if, if Michael Proctor gets indicted or arrested, then the, the then it gets dropped because he's the lead investigator. Just saying. That's the only way. Um, okay. Jill Daniels. My friend Jill sends 25 bucks and says, I had to sober up for an hour or two, but what if Auntie Bev is doing this to assist the feds in indicting everyone? That's why I ran away from the headlights. Um, spotlight. Yeah, it's crazy. And so am I. What if she's doing this to assist the feds in indicting everyone? I don't know how that would assist the feds, but thank you, Jill Daniels, for the dono. Do we have a cash app here? Um, from Christina sends 20 bucks. She says no comment, but thank you very much, Christina. Jane sends 10 bucks and says, Auntie Beverage has a was a twat waffle today. No argument there. Katriona sends 10 bucks and says, Hey, Aiden, are you going to buy Trump's Bible? Please, God, no. Did, I didn't know he had a Bible. I did not know that. Okay. So if anyone else wants to donate, 
You can click at the link at the top for Turtle Chat and write a message, and I'll read it out loud to the class, or cash at me at dollar sign Uncle Turtle Boy, and that works as well. Okay. Back to the uh, back to the matter at hand here. Okay. Chris and Julie Albert's inconsistent statements. The defendant next challenges the testimony given by Chris and Julie Albert. She argues that Chris gave an inconsistent statement regarding his presence at the Albert residence after the waterfall. And Julie Albert changed her story to how she found out O'Keefe had died. And the, the Commonwealth withheld these inconsistent statements from the grand jury. The court, of course, does not agree. Okay. Before the grand jury, Chris and Julie Albert testified that they were at the waterfall, but that neither went back to the Albert residence afterwards. Julie went home early with a headache, and Chris walked home when everyone left the bar. Buchanan testified as to his interview with Chris and Julie Albert, where both made similar statements. The defendant contends that Buchanan's uh, February 21st report memorializing his interview with the witnesses indicated that Julie and Chris Albert did go back to the Albert residence after the waterfall. Ooh, that's interesting. And that the Commonwealth intentionally failed to elicit Chris Albert's inconsistent statements before the grand jury. Given that Albert testified consistently with Sergeant Buchanan's February 10th report that was read to the grand jury, it does not appear to the court that he did in fact give an inconsistent statement. The error appears to lie in Sergeant Buchanan's later report. Oh, Scrivener's error. Eliciting the inconsistency in Buchanan's report would not likely have affected the grand jury's decision to indict. According to her. Because apparently she can get in the mind of these grand jurors. Nor is dismissal warranted based on the defendant's argument that the Commonwealth failed to impeach Julie Albert for her statement regarding how she found out that he was dead. Julie Albert testified before the grand jury that on the morning of January 29th, she woke up at 5.50 a.m. and saw she had a missed call from Jennifer McCabe. She, quote, didn't think, obviously, anything bad, got out of bed, changed her clothes, and headed over to the Albert residence to drop off a gift for her nephew's birthday. Upon arriving at the Albert residence, she learned of O'Keefe's death. Sergeant Buchanan read his report memorializing his interview with Julie Albert in which she gave a different account of the morning. She told Buchanan that, quote, she was asleep at 4.55 a.m. when her phone woke her up and there was Jen's missed call. And that is how she found out about Officer O'Keefe dying. Remember, there is that weird police report where it says Jennifer McCabe called Julie Albert at 4.55 to tell her that he was dead. And it's like, how did Jennifer McCabe know that at 455? Interesting. The court does not agree that the Commonwealth's failure to impeach Julie Albert warrants dismissal. They did not withhold Julie Albert's inconsistent testimony from the grand jury. Both her testimony and the statement she gave Buchanan were before the grand jury. It is therefore not the, the case not the case that the Commonwealth carefully scripted the testimony in order to hide the ball on the grand jury regarding Julie Albert's inconsistent statements. Moreover, even assuming that she falsely recounted how she found out about O'Keefe's death during her grand jury testimony, the defendant must show not only that the evidence was material to the question of probable cause, but on the entire grand jury record, the false or deceptive testimony probably would have affected the decision to indict. The court does not agree with the defendant's assertion that the difference in testimony clearly inculpates Julie Albert and exculpates Miss Reed. It is more than an inferential leap to conclude, as the defendant does, that Julie Albert's statement to Buchanan suggests that she and Jennifer McCabe knew O'Keefe was dead before his body was discovered that morning. Like, I don't, what is she saying here? Like Julie Albert's statement that she, that she knew that John was dead at 455. How the fuck did she know that? And how is, how does that not exculpate Karen Reed? The fact that they know Karen Reed didn't know she, he was dead at that time, but they sure did. So how'd they know that? 
Anyway, all right, introduction of propensity and bad character evidence. The defendant argues the Commonwealth improperly presented the grand jury with prejudicial propensity and bad character evidence for the purpose of obtaining the indictment. The Commonwealth's presentation of evidence from a trip to Aruba. So the defendant objects to the Commonwealth's presentation of evidence from a trip to Aruba that occurred a month before O'Keefe's death, where the defendant accused O'Keefe of having an affair, and the Commonwealth's presentation of hearsay evidence regarding the state of the defendant and O'Keefe's relationship. The court, the court concludes that the presentation of this evidence did not impair the grand jury proceedings because they they used they love this Aruba trip thing. Again, they all went to Aruba like a month before John died, and it didn't. It sounded like a bad vacation for Karen and John. Uh, sounds like they didn't get along that well. Sounds like John was out getting toasted, and she was stuck with the kids, and uh, she was jealous of like some other, you know, whore there. And then the fat chick, Laura Sullivan, she testified. I don't, I don't know. I don't know. And then they just inducted her into Peggy's angels. She got inducted thanks to her favorable testimony. So she's in the cool kids club. Now that chick. Yeah. And Jen McCabe rubs her shoulders in court. Oh, it's disgusting. It's so disgusting. There is no evidence before the court that the Commonwealth presented any false testimony with respect to the events that transpired in Aruba. Nor does the court find such evidence to the improper propensity evidence. Prior bad bad act evidence may be relevant in a grand jury presentation to show something other than propensity. In particular, prior bad, bad act evidence is relevant to show a hostile relationship between the defendant and a victim and to show the state of mind and motive. The evidence presented here was relevant to the defendant's state of mind on the night of the incident and her motive to commit a crime. Additionally, where other evidence before the grand jury demonstrated the strained and hostile nature of the defendant and O'Keefe's relationship, it is unlikely that the events in Aruba were presented for the purpose of obtaining an indictment. Again, what other purpose would it serve at a grand jury than to obtain an indictment? Riddle me that. Riddle me that one. It goes on. The court acknowledges the Commonwealth's presentation of prior bad act testimony with respect to the Aruba trip may have been excessive. And as a result, some of the evidence may have been more prejudicial than prob probative. However, okay. The presentation of hearsay evidence regarding the defendant's relationship with O'Keefe was also not improper. It is well established that an indictment may be based on a whole on hearsay, whole or in part on hearsay. The defendant has not directed the court to any instance where hearsay testimony was used to deceive the grand jury. Accordingly, the presentation of hearsay testimony does not warrant dismissal. But again, I'm going to read. So this guy, Rich, he's an attorney. And this is what he said about that. He said, Judge Canoni thinks the evidence of the Aruba trip presented to the grand jury was excessive, quote unquote. Did she use, they use the word excessive? I don't know. He says that he says the word excessive in here. Is it over here? Oh yeah. She goes, he goes, the presentation of prior bad act testimony with respect to the Aruba trip may have been excessive. And as a result, some of the evidence may have been more prejudicial than probative. So yeah, she's like, yeah, a lot of this stuff, a lot of these details from Aruba, we, it doesn't matter. Just it's, and so he goes, that's also good for trial and foreshadows exclusion of such evidence along with any allegations of infidelity at the trial. So there you go. I mean, that could be interesting. Um, let's read some more. We're almost done. All right. Introduction of lay witness and expert opinion. The defendant contends that the Commonwealth introduced incriminating lay and expert opinion, testimony, and rank speculation for the purpose of obtaining the indictment. First, the, depend the defendant contends the Commonwealth elicited improper hearsay testimony from 
State Police Officer David DeKiko. DeKiko. Okay. Officer DeKiko testified that O'Keefe's brother stated that he, quote, went to the hospital to view O'Keefe's body and that it looked like he had been hit by a car. So DeKiko testified O'Keefe's brother said that he went to the hospital to view O'Keefe's body and it looked like he had been hit by a car. According to the defendant, such testimony improperly served as expert testimony and was intended to substitute for the absence of testimony as to the manner of death. This argument is wholly without merit. Nothing about the testimony would lead the grand jury to believe the statement was an opinion based on scientific, technical, or other specialized knowledge. Then why would they even mention it at the grand jury? I don't know. Thus, the testimony was never false nor deceptive. Even if such a statement would be inadmissible at trial, given the context of the statement, it is relative unimportance in comparison to the other evidence before the grand jury, blah, 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 blah. Okay, so there we go. Finally, uh, testimony from the McCabe's, the good stuff here. Second, the defendant argues that the Commonwealth elicited speculative testimony from Jennifer McCabe and Matthew McCabe. With respect to Matthew, the defendant contends the Commonwealth asked him to speculate as to the reason the defendant's car was parked outside the Albert residence for a period of time, but neither O'Keefe nor the defendant entered the house. So he was asked, the Commonwealth asked Matt McCabe to speculate as to why Karen Reed's car was parked outside the Albert residence for a period of time, but that neither Karen nor John or Karen or John entered the residence. However, the question posed by the prosecutor was about how long the defendant's car was in front of the house, not the reason it was there. Thus, contrary to the defendant's contention, the Commonwealth did not elicit speculative testimony from Matt McCabe. Moreover, Matthew's response made it clear that he had no idea as to why the vehicle was parked out there for so long. So this is Matt McCabe's grand jury testimony. Yes, the car was out there. We just thought it was weird, you know? In hindsight, were they having a disagreement in the car? I don't know. You know? I don't know why the car was out there. Why it was parked there. It wasn't as if they pulled up and I looked outside and the next thing you know, they were gone. They definitely moved the car and for some reason never came in the house. So that car was out there for a long time, he said. But there's just one problem with that. There's a lot of problems with that statement. First of all, Ryan Nagel was testified that, and the two people in the truck with Ryan Nagel, they're all telling the same story that John O'Keefe was not in the car he was not outside of the car. But now Matt McCabe, who likes to stand in windows at parties and just stare outside. Remember this? He just stares outside. He likes to stare outside. And he notices like V-shaped tires, tracks in the snow until they abandon the three-point turn, which they just want you to forget about that. But Matt McCabe just stands there at parties and, and watches when watches shit. And he just watches this car sit there and it's like so you're just watching this matt and okay did you see did you watch when she ran him over or did you hear that wouldn't that be loud like that would be this dude's just watching them out oh what are they doing out there are they fighting huh you know fighting what's going on out there what's going on out there like why was he monitoring dur this during a party how whack was this party so anyway, that's obviously Big Mac's uh, testimony is pretty shady. It says the grand jury heard testimony from Jennifer McCabe that after arriving at the Albert residence from the waterfall, she was looking out the window when she saw the defendant's vehicle pull up to the front of the house. Over the next 15 minutes, the vehicle remained outside the residence. See, that doesn't make it. That con that's not true. That's not true because there is audio of, of her arriving back at One Meadows Ave at 1241 in the garage. So the car couldn't have been there for 15 minutes. Couldn't have been. It's impossible. Such a liar. 
Jennifer McCabe noticed that at some point the vehicle moved to a different spot on the road. During this time, she texted O'Keefe and accidentally called him. Accident, another butt dial, but he didn't answer. She further testified that at some point the vehicle was no longer there and she assumed the defendant and O'Keefe had left and gone home. Okay. But then she told another story about how she saw them drive away at 1245. She also said that. All right. Next. Therefore, even if the question invited speculative testimony, given the other evidence before the grand jury, the defendant and O'Keefe had a strained relationship and were arguing that night. Matthew's testimony that he did not know if they were having a disagreement would not have made a difference. I don't know if they were having a disagreement. Then why are you even saying anything at all? With respect to Jennifer McCabe, the defendant contends the Commonwealth elicited speculative testimony as to why O'Keefe's niece described the defendant as acting crazy on the morning of July 20, uh, January 29th. However, this testimony was prompted by a question from a grand juror, not the prosecutor. The grand juror asks O'Keefe's niece, when you spoke to her, said Karen Reed was acting crazy. Do you know how long you know or any information from your conversation with the niece, like how long Karen Reed was there speaking to her or what she means by quite crazy. Thus, even if the response was speculative, it was not elicited by the Commonwealth for the purpose of obtaining the indictment. Um, okay. How about this? Jennifer McCabe testified that on the morning of January 29th, when she and the defendant went back to O'Keefe's residence before going out to look for him, she talked to O'Keefe's niece who said the defendant was acting crazy. The court notes that after the grand juror posed the question, the prosecutor said to McCabe, if you know, question mark, this interjection does not change the court's analysis as this question originated from the grand juror. As a piece. Okay, whatever. All right. Nicholas Garino's report. This is my favorite part. This bullshit. Finally, the defendant contends the Commonwealth put improper expert opinion before the grand jury when Proctor read reports from state police computer forensic expert and Westfield State graduate Trooper Garino to the grand jury. Pursuant to search warrants, Trooper Garino seized an infotainment system and telematic system from the defendant's vehicle. Proctor read Garino's report to the grand jury. On January 29th, Trooper Proctor and Buchanan uh, responded to the death of John O'Keefe at the date uh, at 34 Fairview Road in Canton. By the way, they responded to the death, unattended death at 34 Fairview Road. But Morrissey said they weren't on the scene at all that day. Okay. It was found that O'Keefe was a victim of motor vehicle homicide. Buchanan and myself responded to 345 Country Hill Drive in Dighton and secured her Lexus SUV, um, who was, she's now a suspect in this case. The vehicle was towed to the Canton Police Department. The vehicle was towed from Canton PD to the Milton Barracks. Wait, on Wednesday? So why was the car towed to the Canton Police Department as evidence? If the Canton Police Department is not on the case. The Foxborough... Although I was told Foxborough doesn't have like a Sally Port garage. But why would you bring it to the Canton Police Department if they are conflicted out? Why would you bring it back to Canton Police? Um, on February 2nd, the vehicle was towed from Canton to the Milton Barracks. I supplied search warrant number issued out of the Stoughton District Court. The evidence was secured. One infotainment system. Okay. State police also seized the defendant's cell phone and, and performed a cell phone extraction and forensic analysis. Proctor read Trooper Garino's report concerning the defendant's cell phone to the grand jury. It also stated through his investigation that, quote, it was found that O'Keefe was a victim of a motor vehicle homicide and, and concluded, at this time, we were unable to access the data on the phone. The defendant argues that through this testimony, the Commonwealth elicited improper expert opinion that O'Keefe was the victim of a vehicular homicide. Okay. The court does not agree with the defendant's characterization of the testimony. It may have been misleading for the report to state. It may have been misleading for the report to state through Trooper Garino's investigation. 
It was found that O'Keefe was the victim of a motor vehicle homicide. The report thereafter clearly states that the police were unable to access the data from the defendant's vehicle or phone. Therefore, it is unlikely that the testimony deceived the grand jurors into believing Trooper Garino reviewed electronic evidence in this case, suggesting he was struck by a vehicle. Okay. Even if suggested by the defendant, the opening sentence of the report may have led the grand jury to believe that the police had conclusively determined that O'Keefe was killed by a car, given that all evidence before the grand jury suggesting that the defendant's vehicle struck O'Keefe, it didn't influence the jury's decision to indict. Okay, nothing did. Well, how about the Google search? I like the Google search part here. All right. In the supplemental memorandum, the defendant argues that the Commonwealth intentionally deceived the grand jury by presenting an incomplete extraction of Jennifer McGabe's cell phone as an exhibit before the grand jury. Um, they left out the Google search made at 2.27 a.m. before O'Keefe's body was discovered, stating how, how long to die in cold. The defendant has not shown that the Commonwealth improperly withheld this evidence. Excuse me? So remember, Jennifer McCabe hands her cell phone over to the state police after deleting all her phone calls and Google searches. Just hands it over. I have nothing to hide. Here you go. And Nicholas Garino, the expert who is doing traffic stops in Norwood like five years ago, he's now the forensic expert. He takes the phone and he extracts it. He plugs it into the computer. He does the full extraction. And... He doesn't find anything about any Google search. Nothing comes up. No, how long? Did, I mean, the 624 one that she didn't delete comes up, but the 227 one just doesn't come up. So that's, oops, we missed that one. And we missed all the calls that she deleted between 5 and 9 a.m. Just missed all those. In her supplemental memorandum, the defendant argues that the Commonwealth, intent. oh, wait, we already read that part. The grand jury exhibited uh, the grand jury exhibit referred to the defendant is it by the referred to by the defendant is a cell bright cell phone extraction report from McCabe's cell phone containing the call log contacts, instant messages and tags in her phone. A more recent cell bright report obtained during the federal investigation. So this is not Rick, Rick Green's report. This is the federal investigation provides the web history of the phone, including the aforementioned Google search at 2 27 AM. This is auntie Bev saying guys that the 2 27 AM search is legit. The judge is now on record saying that, that she believes this. So how can this go forward? If Jennifer McCabe Googled that at 2 27, There is no evidence that the more recent report was available to the Commonwealth at the time of the grand jury proceedings. What? There's no evidence. So basically she's saying, the, the, the defense is saying, well, why didn't you use this celebrate report? Clearly, like all this data was on there and you just didn't present it to the grand jury. So what's up with that? Like it's kind of important stuff. The 227 search kind of important. And they say there's no evidence that the more recent one was available to the Commonwealth at the time of the grand jury. What? Indeed, based on an examination of the two reports, it appears that the more recent report used an updated version of software, which included web history, data files, and activity sensor data that the previous software did not extract bull fucking shit bullshit bullshit they're saying that somehow in 2022 this is not the stone age okay this is 2022 that somehow the software did not exist where police could find deleted messages so it's not, they didn't intentionally hide this. They just didn't have the software because Auntie Bev is a fucking software expert now. This is what she is. And by the way, this is what Lally and them have said in court. This is what Lally and them said in court is that, oh, well, we didn't have the updated Celebrate. First of all, isn't that also an admission that the Google search is legit? 
well, it's like, well, we the newer stuff is better, so we didn't have that. So it's that we weren't hiding, we weren't hiding the 227 search. The 227 search is real, we weren't hiding it. So like what this idea that Celebrite in 2022 is just not able to find deleted messages is insane. You've been able to find deleted messages for for quite some time on phones. Give me a break. Um because the Commonwealth could not have withheld this information, it did not have. It was not aware it existed at the time of the grand jury. The defendant has not established that they withheld it. So they're not they're not corrupt. They're just retarded. That's what she's saying here. The, the Commonwealth is not corrupt in withholding evidence. They're just retarded. The state police don't are too stupid to have seen this. That's what she's saying here. There's no evidence that they withheld this shit. They're just retarded. What? I mean, this is what it says. This is what she's saying. Because the Commonwealth could not have withheld the information that it did not have, it was not aware it existed because they're too stupid to find deleted Google searches. The defendant hasn't established that it was withheld. There you go. And finally, collusion between Jennifer McCabe and Carrie Roberts. Finally, the defendant contends the Commonwealth withheld from the grand jury that prior to their grand jury testimony, Jen McCabe and Carrie Roberts wrote a timeline of events. Oh my God. They wrote a timeline of events. That occurred on January 29th. And they showed that timeline to the state prosecutor. So these two clams got together and they put their goddamn timeline together. And then they brought the timeline with them. According to the defendant, by not eliciting testimony from these witnesses regarding the timeline, the Commonwealth properly misled the grand jury into believing that Jennifer McCabe and Kerry Roberts testified to their own independent recollection of events that occurred on January 29th. <laughs> the court does not agree with the defendant that the failure to elicit such testimony undermined the witness's credibility and impaired the integrity of the proceedings. The two witnesses who are friends and who were with the defendant on the morning in question, didn't they testify that they didn't really know each other? I, I want to say that Carrie and, and Jen previously said they didn't really know each other prior to this. The two witnesses who are friends and who were with the defendant on the morning in question discussed the timeline of events that occurred before their testimony before the grand jury does not seriously undermine the credibility. How about this footnote, by the way? The court notes that the time or times of the Google search is a hotly disputed issue. Except it's not. <laughs> uh, even if it may have been a better practice for the prosecutor to elicit testimony about their written timeline, the failure to do so did not seriously take the grand jury proceedings. This is denied. So there you go. We all knew that was going to happen. They sat down. It's, a, it's what I'm saying. What? Imagine if someone sent a witness up to the stand with notes from the attorney beforehand and what he wants them to say. It's it is coaching. It is coaching for sure. All right. So uh, you know, we'll see. Let me read some turtle chats here. First, we got Jonathan sends five bucks, says this process so far has been a disgrace. How are we supposed to have a civilized society if this is how the government can behave and have people like Bev and their victims off the trial instead of them? Totally agree. Totally agree, Jonathan. Uh, Stephanie sends 10 bucks. says, Melanie was awesome tonight. Well, that chat slowly tortured us, dude. Okay, I was watching Surviving the Survivor tonight. I like it. Like, but I, I don't know. Like, dude, the mod, like, so, okay. I'm going to put this on real quick. Where'd it go? I I went on this once with um, Wendy Murphy. You remember that cl clown? Uh, 
and I have not been back on since. But like Melanie went on tonight, Melanie this- Little, and uh, so in the chat tonight, where'd the chat go? Can't see the chat, the live chat, dude. The mods kept like I went on there and I made a comment like this, this guy, this one right here. I was on a panel with him before. That guy doesn't know a fucking thing about this case. And neither does the woman next to him. Like it's amazing. Every other murder, like the Murdoch case or anything else, Delphi, whatever. All like they all seem to know these cases real well. They bring them on. They've got a lot of opinions and they seem to know the case. In this case, I don't know why every fucking panel on Core TV or in anything, nobody knows shit. Like I've never seen a case where more people want to talk that don't know shit. That just haven't done any basic research into it whatsoever. Melanie Little has. And she fucking schooled these people today. She was spitting hot facts. Go check it out. Yeah. Oh, so that was, was that me too? So every time I went to write something in there, I couldn't, uh, you know, Every time I went to go write something, I would be timed out for like four minutes. Was everybody's like that? It's, I don't know. It wasn't a fan. I felt like it was like a click in there. It was weird. And some of the, the mods were hostile. Everybody who had a green thing, everybody was in the club. I don't know what the club is, the green. Some people have the green a year a member or something. I don't know what that means because I'm not monetized. I, I don't have any of that stuff. But it was odd. And I, I'm just so sick of people like this dude right here who keep getting invited. And I was on a panel with him on long crime recently. He didn't know shit. And it's just like, I, come on. Can you find somebody at least Kofin Dafer? She lies about everything, but she has a general understanding of the case. With so this guy gets up there and he, Oh my God, with the Southern act, it's just too much. It's just too much. Oh, so it's a long wait between chats if you're not a paying member. Is that how they get you? Oh, I see. I see. It was like a four-minute slow. Yeah, you had to wait five minutes between each comment. That is so dumb. It makes me, it's just like, uh, what What the, why would I want to do this? I don't know. I think it's gay. I'm not doing it. But anyway. Uh, back to the chats here. Um, uh, Latina Latina sends 10 bucks. It says, if it's no big deal that Proctor knew the Alberts, then why didn't Lally deny it a million times? Great question. Why did he say the sister of the brother of the husband or the wife of the husband is how they knew each other? Why did Lally j- say just because you go to a wedding, it doesn't mean that you're best friends? Why did Miss McLaughlin say the defense was making up the relationship? Great question, Latina, Latina. It's all, it's like asking if if John O'Keefe was killed outside the house, why are they so trying so hard to put Colin Albert not at the house at all? That's another question I have. Anything on KP Super Chats on Vinny today? No, I mean, it was just pathetic. She paid like an unemployed woman paid like 30 bucks to like yell at Vinny Politan. <laughs> Basically, that's the gist of it all. A woman who is currently facing was recently charged with witness intimidation and is being arraigned for that felony on April 24th. Um, you think other judges, Carrie Lama says, 10 bucks, are looking at Auntie Bev like, what the fuck? I know they are. Because literally, if this was any other judge, this wouldn't have still been going on. I mean, I've Judge McCollum across the street is even worse, I would say. Kelly sends 25 bucks. No comment. Thank you, Kelly. Sean sends 10 bucks. Says, I was driving down the street and saw Julie Albert on the side of the road. I yelled, you're a loser. Where's your award? Turns out I was tired and was yelling at a wrinkled leather punching bag from the 1980s that someone was throwing away. <laughs> oh, you people crack me up, man. You crack me. Oh, that's good. Uh, Kelly sends 10 bucks. Says, I came across your channel for the first time. You covered the Karen Reed case. I was going through some difficult times and your continued coverage was the perfect distraction to keep me on the right track and occupied. Awesome, Kelly. Now, thanks to you, my days are filled up with Turtle Boy Live, LTL, 
the glare and attorney Melanie Little. I cannot thank you enough. Don't ever change. You are doing amazing things. Well, thank you, Kelly. I really appreciate that. John sends 10 bucks says, who will oppose the motion to have a 500 foot buffer zone around the courthouse? It is a first amendment issue. So it doesn't seem like Jackson or Yanetti would fight it. I was thinking the same thing. Would Bradle or another lawyer file an opposition to protect our first amendment rights to protest? That is exactly what I was thinking. And I think it's going to be allowed exactly for that reason. I mean, Bradle's not going to just take up some, I mean, he's busy. It's like, he's not just going to take up a case for free. Let's be honest. Um, but honestly, it's like as much as we want to, uh, like we're not going to protest every day of the trial. It's six weeks long. So much, maybe once a week, or we could just protest right outside the 500 foot zone. Like just go to the fucking next, you know, traffic. I don't know, but 500 feet. That's a lot. What are they afraid of? They can also bring in the people um, from the pat, like they can bring in the jurors in the back door. But okay, so thank you very much, John. Uh, good question. I was wondering that myself. Uh, do we have any cash apps here? Um. Frank K sends five bucks and says, no, con oh, did Paul get paid for John's death? I don't know. Uh, Jeffrey sends 10 bucks and says the federal grand jury debunked almost all of this mess. Yes, they did. Yes, they did. Okay. Sandra Barty sends 10 bucks and says, always have your back. Love you. Thank you, Sandra. I appreciate that very much. Okay. If anyone else wants to donate, Turtle Chat is linked at the top, or you can cash at me at dollar sign Uncle Turtle Boy. Okay. So uh, let's bring up the actual hearing that happened today. All right. Court TV. Did they stream? Did Court TV stream it? Who streamed it? Whoa, whoa. It jumped there. That scared me. Uh, okay. Court. Actually, is there an actual stream of it today? Where did we watch it today? Were we watching it on social media? I know I watched it right off of NBC's website, I think. Let me check Boston 25. All right. Karen Reed hearing. Okay. See what comes up. 10 hours ago. I think I found it. The idea of having one stream of income just didn't say today. And so council will argue the motion here uh, this morning. So but yeah, not many McAlberts today for sure. Is Paul looking? Uh, I'm sure Paul really came to court today, like interest with an open mind, wanting to learn about this, wanted to hear the facts of the case. Definitely. Um, there's Carl in the back, obviously. He's cuck. Jackie Chan was there. Jackie Chan List was there. Before we begin, um, I have been told repeatedly from both Mr. Jackson and Mr. Yanetti, and I do understand completely that Mr. Yanetti cannot be here today. He certainly excused from being here today. Uh, but I was told that there would be a motion for egregious, a motion to dismiss based on egregious government misconduct. Uh, I had asked Mr. I was told that by both Mr. Jackson and Mr. Yanetti. Uh, I asked Mr. Yanetti how that motion that's his wife, Erin O'Keefe. Erin O'Keefe. Motion for sanctions and um, motion to disqualify the district attorney's office. Um, he assured me that it was, in fact, different. He assured me that um, he would put in the body of the motion how it was different. And he assured me as recently as last week that that motion would be filed later that day. So that motion has not been filed. 
um, that motion then is waived. So what we have today are two motions regarding Rule 14 obligations. So who's going to argue? Is it Ms. Unetti or? Okay, so I haven't decided that because I was waiting. For uh, so basically the gist of this one is that they asked them what's like they, they didn't file their latest motion to dismiss and people are like what's up with that oh they forgot it they, they didn't forget shit she said it was strategic here this is what she says for the motion for egregious conduct uh motion for sanctions or motion to dismiss based on egregious governmental misconduct because i needed to be assured that that was different than the motion to disqualify if i had known it was not coming and maybe no intention of filing it, I would have decided that motion by now. Your Honor, there was, it was a strategic decision okay. for us not to file that motion. It's not because it wasn't meritorious. It was a strategic decision. All right. Me. You made representations that you were, therefore the other motion. I have not acted on that yet. I just want so, you to note the objection, please. Yeah, the objection's noted. So please move on to the merits yes, of your discovery request. Uh, absolutely. Your Honor, we're at so there we go. Uh, so people are wondering about that. It's because they knew they were going to lose the motion to dismiss. And they are withholding, holding on to bombs that they would like to use in trial instead of using it now so that Adam Wally can't come up with some bullshit excuse or bullshit response for, you know, that he, that he always does. That's That's what this was. Asking for material that fits squarely within the parameters of Rule 14. In certain conversations, the state police were even present. Statements of witnesses are simply discoverable. Although they lodged general objections to each of our requests, and these were really boilerplate objections, the Norfolk DA's office appears to be arguing that these witness statements contained in their notes of their conversations, multiple conversations, are all work product. Neither this court nor we are in a position to judge whether the notes are strictly work product without actually seeing the notes. Work product is defined as legal research, opinions, theories, or conclusions. And to be clear, we are not interested in the Norfolk DA's office's opinions, theories, or conclusions. To, to the extent that these notes contain work product along with the statements, we are fine with the work product being redacted we are not interested in their work product, but it is important for us to know whether their notes contain any statements of witnesses. And if they do, they should be turned over to us. Otherwise, discoverable material is not off limits simply because a prosecutor writes something in the margins of a document. That would give an attorney the power to keep otherwise discoverable materials out of the hands of a party who should legally be entitled to see the material at a minimum your Honor, this court should order the Norfolk DA's office to disclose whether its notes contain any statements. They have not disclosed that. If the notes contain any witness statements and if the Norfolk DA's office is objecting to producing them to the defense, then this court, we're asking this court to have the DA's office produce those notes to the court so that this court can conduct an in-camera review of those notes of their notes and evaluate whether they are truly all work product or whether there is in fact discoverable material contained therein. Beyond that, Your Honor, we would rest on our motion and our brief. Yeah, basically give us, the, they're not giving them the notes. Why are they objecting all these notes uh, from the police? Often they don't have any notes, but Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Then Lally gets we'll up and speaks. Any of those specific meetings occurring? Um, oh, but if there oh, were God. meetings, oh, any God. meeting with oh, a witness post grand jury was in reference to uh, either harassment that they were sustaining what? as a result of, of actions of others in this case, or as a result of oh, I see a simple explanation as to Rule 17 motions. Look at his hair. How old is this fucking guy with his hair? Seriously. Seriously, dude. It just. <laughs> Okay. He's saying that they met, so that these, they met, they met with the, the, so the state police and the DA's office met with witnesses days before they testified the grand jury, not to coach them up about what to say in front of the grand jury, but to talk about the harassment from turtle boy. That's what he's saying right there. They were getting harassed by certain people. 
everything is my fault. Wait, so, so Olivia says, no, Aiden, they're asking for notes from DA Lally's conference call meetings with the witnesses. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. That's what they want. And they're saying now, Lally's just like, these notes aren't about coaching of the witnesses. These notes are about Turtle Boy. This is what he said. This is, Everything comes back to me, these fucking people. Listen to what he says. Recall any of those specific meetings occurring, um, but if there were meetings, any meeting with a witness post grand jury was in reference to uh, either harassment that they were sustaining as a result of, of actions of me. others in this case, or as a result uh, actions of oh, they're blaming Karen Reed for that actually. Others in this case, so it's like oh yeah, we we weren't meeting to discuss the grand jury. We were meeting to discuss Turtle Boy being mean. That's what we were doing. Jen McCabe DM'd Aiden in July. Remember when she sexually harassed me? Let's not forget that. She sent me John Como nudes. She did out of out of the blue. She remember Jen got drunk and messaged me that. People forget about that. Those are back in the old days. Back in the old days. Results of uh, a simple explanation as to Rule 17 motions that have been filed for individuals' phones or phone records or uh, other uh, third-party records that they were the subject of. It's a boilerplate response because it's a boilerplate uh, law that applies in this case uh, as far as uh, work product uh, that applies uh, to each and every one of the uh, requests with the exception of number eight, of which the Commonwealth has uh, no objection to that. Explain to me how work product applies. Your Honor, work product applies uh, it, and specifically in reference to, uh, it, I mean, it's contained within, uh, and I would largely rest on the Commonwealth's motion, but it's contained within uh, what's cited as uh, Beng Xiao Lang uh, in regard to uh, interview notes uh, in preparation of, of testimony is work product under the case law, under the rule of criminal procedure. Um, the uh, this fucking whatever guy. notations uh, may be contained uh, within those, um, but essentially uh, these are not statements um, as they're defined under Rule 14 um, from any of these uh, conversations uh, with witnesses. Uh, rule 14 doesn't blah, apply blah, 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 uh, to blah. these statements, number one. But secondly, if there is uh, any content, uh, it's either already been uh, provided through the course of it's okay. already been provided. Uh, uh, with witnesses, whether reduced to writing or not, um, you know, are within the ambit of, of the work product doctrine. There's more response. word salad. Any response? That's all that is. You don't necessarily have to, but I just want to see if you want right. to. Right. He's not their attorney. Um, she I, not be canceling them. I would just say, Your Honor, their, their opposition to our motion does not even acknowledge whether there are statements or not statements. I just heard Mr. Lally say that there, in fact, are statements. This is very specifically what? for men over 30 years old who make at least 150 grand annually in the next 40. Okay. So I am going to ask again that this court take those notes there and, and go through it and in camera and decide whether in fact all of it is work product or whether there exists within it um, discoverable materials with statements of witnesses. And I find it hard to believe that there wouldn't be any statements of witnesses concerning this case. Thank you. Oh, See where I respond at all. Your Honor, again, with reference to the, as they term them, interviews, but essentially phone calls with witnesses, these were in regard to explaining to them the Rule 17 process, explaining to them what counsel had filed, what types of records were being requested. Um, it was in large part me talking as far as explaining the law and things of that nature. There were not any statements related Good to question. the case or any um, testimony that was discussed or anything of that nature. Um, the one thing that I was referring to is there is one request that does deal with uh, a meeting which involves uh, preparation of a witness for grand jury oh. and whatever that witness uh, indicated in the course of that was testified to before the grand jury and it's contained within the minutes and contained within uh, police reports of interviews. Uh, so, they, so, they, so, so they did coach you. nothing to report. What? All right. All right. The next motion. Yeah, he's not is their attorney. The Commonwealth's motion for reciprocal discovery. But before we begin with that, Mr. Lally, could you tell me what reciprocal discovery has been provided to the Commonwealth at this point? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. What? All right. So trial is three weeks from today. Um, 
when did the Commonwealth um, provide its certificate? Uh, so the Commonwealth is un unable to file a certificate of compliance at this point. The one I would say sort of primary piece that we're waiting on is uh, there were two rounds of DNA testing that were done at the Bodie Lab in Virginia. One of those was completed. Um, that was in regard to uh, the defendant's taillight. Uh, that was finished, I think, first week of March, and council already has all of that. Uh, the okay. second piece I can't listen in to relation to uh, the hair from- uh, Oh, the hair. They, the the hair. they love the hair. They love the hair. Just for sort of review it's purposes, that was something that uh, had gone or undergone um, sort of typical DNA testing, which is autosomal DNA testing, which is taking- Oh my God. I need to generate a sample under the autosomal. I got, I got, I got uh, to fast so forward. Asked, uh, and the court had ordered uh, for the mitochondrial DNA testing, which goes to the maternal side uh, only. Um, and the Bodie Lab is able to do that. My latest update from that, and I say all that just to build up as to a sort of caveat as far as the, the testing is concerned. So the motherfucker. initial estimate as far as the testing was, uh, would put us several weeks out. Uh, we had asked- I, I'm with you, Sarah. Day, I don't even know what this motherfucker is saying. That they can turn around report would be sometime in mid-April. Um, the caveat to that is whether this or not- guy like his job. Quantity and quality for them to generate a mitochondrial DNA profile from the sample. That I should have an answer to, I was told by the end of the month. So hopefully by either the end of this week or okay. very early next week, um, because obviously if they aren't able to generate a mitochondrial DNA profile from the sample, then there's no reason to generate one from the victim and do a comparison. Uh, so that would sort of end it there and then we would then be able to file a certificate of compliance. All right, every other aspect of the case though? Every other aspect of the case, uh, as I mentioned, there was a sort of number eight in the defendant's motion to compel uh, that we should have uh, to them by the end of this week, if not earlier. Um, so every other aspect of the case as far as discovery goes uh, should, be, should be done from the Commonwealth's perspective. And that's the reason that I filed the motion, Your Honor, at this time, understanding that they're not obligated under the rules of criminal procedure to provide anything, but given that we have an April 15th trial date and I have nothing as far as any sort of reports or notice of experts or testing or anything really at all, um, you know, I'd appreciate being able to, to get that, review that, or at least see it you know, prior to the day we're in panel. Okay. Dude, I've never seen somebody say less. No, we don't need to file them any reciprocal discovery until they file of, of documents. I mean, four days ago, we received uh, like 400 pages of documents we haven't gone through. Um, Council just handed us a thumb drive with, I don't know what's on this thumb drive. We have to go through <laughs> that. So we haven't given any reciprocal discovery because we are not obligated to do so. Do you intend to call experts? Yes. In areas other than DNA? I'm going to have to defer to uh, Mr. Jackson, who is on Zoom. To right, the counsel of to arguing these motions was to be present here. In court oh, today. this cut. Listen to this. Right. Your Honor, the, if I could be heard for just a second on that issue, Mr. Lally made it very clear that given the fact that he was not in, in compliance with his discovery obligations, that this motion was not to be heard today. So this is sort of coming out of nowhere. Uh, no, no, no. no, no, no hold on. Hold on. Hold on. So Mr. Lally doesn't decide what motions were to be argued. Today was for all non-evidentiary pre-trial motions were to be argued. This was filed timely. This was on for today. If you feel that you cannot argue it, that's a different story. What a cunt. Remember, same lady who like earlier was like, you can do this on Zoom. And now it's like, oh, you can't say this because you're on Zoom. So you are muted. Oh, he's muted. All right. Mr. Jackson, you're muted. She hates him. She does hate him. I don't know him. how I got muted. Uh, yes, we are uh, intending to, to call experts, and there are going to be experts that, that are in areas other than DNA as well. But we haven't provided discovery because we don't even know what the 400 pages that we just, or 500 pages that we just got three or four days ago include, nor the discovery that was handed to us this morning. As soon as the, the Commonwealth gets finished with their compliance obligations, we will then comply with our discovery obligations. We have every intention of doing so. We're fully prepared to do so. We're waiting on them. So once you get it from the Commonwealth, you can have it in a matter of a day or so, other than the DNA? Well, I don't know if I can do it in a day, but well, once you, we have you, you do know, if you're calling witnesses, you know who you're calling, correct? A day? I have an idea of who I'm calling, yes. All right, and you've engaged experts, so you've been working with experts, so you should have all that information ready to disclose, correct? We are in, in the process of getting those decisions finalized, yes, but some of them are going to be predicated on what the, the, the Commonwealth discovery, and the, the totality of the Commonwealth discovery looks like. So right. That's their obligation. No, I understand. All right, but you will be calling witnesses and you will be calling expert witnesses? Absolutely. All right. What is your estimate as to how long this case will take to try? Oh, I didn't know that, Olivia. I assume if the if the Commonwealth case, I'm just going a dart at a dartboard, but based on what I know, if the Commonwealth case takes three to four weeks, I think our case would probably take two weeks. Okay. All right. Mr. Lally, I suggest that you get that information as soon as possible. Um, it could be that I strike it, but um, I would hear from the defense on that as well. But at least find out if they're able to do the testing. Yeah, sure. All right. All right. Thank you. you All right, so that's, we'll see you then. 
All right, so kind of an uneventful hearing, uh, but, you know, we're going to trial, it looks like, barring some sort of uh, somebody getting arrested. And again, this is going to be, you know, I've said this from the beginning. I don't think this should go to trial. I was charged with witness intimidation because I said as much. I don't think this should go to trial. I think it's a sham. But the selfish part of me wants a trial, man. This is going to be great for, I mean, this is going to be six weeks of me streaming this every day. We're going to stream this shit every day. And every day is going to be interesting. Every day is going to be wild. It's going to be nonstop entertainment. But I feel bad because it's at the expense of Karen Reed and her family uh, and their mental health dealing with all this. And ultimately, at the end of this, when she's acquitted, when, if, you know, not if, when she's acquitted, Karen Reed has a 0% chance of being convicted in this. 0.0% chance. Uh, and I don't know what they're doing. And this is only going to help my case with witness intimidation, quite frankly, because these people are going to fall apart on the stand. And it's going to be awesome. I don't know when the charges against me are going to get dropped, but it ain't going to be that much longer. Like, Anyway, um, so yeah, we'll see. Um, can we? I'm going to play uh, just a couple minutes of this surviving the survivor thing because I was... I'm just so sick of these people that don't know what they're talking about. I'm going to pull it up. Where'd it go? There it is. Can't watch the whole thing. Uh, Ten of them to the back of her head and neck. Uh, other responders. It would be felonies that if we could, but uh yeah, yeah, I, well, I want to get so, back to You know, it. going along the, uh, the, the sense of, like, you could never believe that people could conspire to cover this up, right? So you would never believe that he went in the house, something happened in there, and then he was dragged out onto the front lawn and just left there. You could never believe that. You couldn't wrap your head around that, right? So she wakes up the next morning. She's freaking out. He's not home. She is with two of John's friends who may have, you know, planted something in her head. And she goes there and she freaks out and he's laying where she saw him get out of the car. And she's like, I hit him. I hit him because you just can't wrap your head around right. anything else nefarious that could have happened. I, I that's yeah, she, personally offends me in my, what if, and like your viewer pointed out, she said um, that that is missing. And the Commonwealth says that Karen's the only one who had access to the ring. App. Well, you know who else had access to the ring app? Michael the Proctor. lead investigator on the case, Trooper Michael Proctor. That's really powerful. That what building signs free Karen. Oh, okay. Listen uh, to this. At the police show in the this case. There are no Dar witnesses. When they bring Darryl, this guy, you've been out. around the block. Have you ever heard of this? The answer is no, and it's spelled N O. Quite frankly, when I was a prosecutor, whether it was Miami or Atlanta, cases I've defended. You always want your police officer to look the part that he or she should play. If you had a narcotics agent have related to, so have people that are so entrenched on both sides. Yes, he did. No, she didn't. He didn't die by her hand. It was a frame from Framingham. Who knows? This is just crazy. It's it's a reality show in the courtroom almost that's taken on a life of its own and the court is going to have to gavel down a lot. Um, I was looking at another story by a local Boston uh, TV station. It read this, I'm paraphrasing here, but murder suspect Karen Reeve arrived uh, at court Tuesday, greeted by a chanting crowd, holding signs, free Karen uh, at the Massachusetts courthouse today. Megan Sachs. I mean, we saw things similar to this similar i don't like this um, comparison if you go back to michael jackson michael you jackson go back to oj but oj um stop she's it. become sort of this cult of personality mm -hmm. is it be what is it like what is behind this that's what i um what is behind this any who wants to fill them in i don't want to toot my own horn here but i think i had something to do with that i think i had something to do with the crowds and the protests and the free can read movement. I think I played a small part in that. Like that's a simple answer. <laughs> the simple answer. But uh I want I guess my bigger question is innocent. if I wasn't hosting yeah, a true in her crime innocence. show, I don't know that I would have the energy with three children and doing other things and you know hoping that I have some semblance of 
a life out there that I would have the energy to put this into um, a trial. So who are these people and why are they so passionate? Yeah, who are these people? Well, it's interesting I, that you – As I insult everyone in Boston. I'm, I <laughs> everyone yeah, you, that. <laughs> you, better, you better hope people are showing up at your book signing. You know? Hummingbird um, books, basically. <laughs> <laughs> I want to know about the Manhattan one so I could come. But anyway. I'm going to um, let you know. Okay. Um, and there's, there's going to be Jersey, too. Go ahead. I'll meet you. Oh, okay. Great. So okay. interestingly, you pointed to Michael Jackson and OJ. These are celebrity figures, right? So people are interested, but can they relate to celebrity figures? Are they identifying with them? What? Not really, right? We're just interested. We want to peer what? in. Something about this woman is relatable to people. You know, they feel like they've. No, nothing about Karen Reed is relatable. Nothing. <laughs> no, none of you people are out there. Because Karen, you're like, you know what? I relate to Karen Reed. I too worked for Fidelity and was a college, an adjunct college professor. I really relate to her. No, not, not a single one of you is out there because you relate to Karen Reed. You're out there because she's clearly innocent. That's what fucking, because she's innocent. These people don't know anything. If they knew fucking any, like, and I'm just so sick of these panels about this topic where nobody knows what the fuck you're talking about, except for Melanie Little. She knows everything. Exactly. This is relatable. Relatable. Like, honestly, I'm more relatable. Like, previously, before this, I was probably more relatable to Chris Albert, as much as I don't want to admit that. But Chris Albert was more, uh, like, he was a turtle rider. And we probably voted for the same people and shit. You know? Like, then the murder happened, and we're no longer relatable. But prior to that, Oh, then the bills and stuff. So I guess I'm not that relatable to him, but you get what I'm saying here. You get what I'm saying? Like Karen, Re like not a single one of you out is out there because you're relatable. Uh, this is called surviving the survivor. I went on there once he's got a, over a hundred thousand subs. It's interesting. Cause my streams get like three times the, I don't want to brag, but like three times the viewers, like we're at 11 o'clock right now. There's uh, a grand total of 7,200 people watching right now on Twitter and on YouTube. Um, but I don't know, maybe it's cause he needs better panelists, either been her or been in a position like hers or been on the other side of that's really powerful here. Uh, Megan, by the way, is there hope for the future? How are your students? Do they, oh God, well, then the phone, it disappears okay. on the prosecution side. Then James Lynch says the facts prove Karen was framed. I'm very interested to see. I'll be honest. I have not studied this case the way most people have studied it. I have followed it and try to keep up on it. But it's also um, I'm just not that smart. And there's so many twists and turns. It's hard for me to keep up with it. But um, Melanie, to you from Nina here, Commonwealth motion says surveillance. Uh, is it's like, is that not tip? I mean, it's a nice guy. Joel seems like a nice guy. I go on a show if you wanted me to. But, you know. Can, why are we hosting panels if we don't know the fact? I just don't get it. I would not host a pan. I would not have a show about something that I wasn't informed about. There's just a lot of that He's going missing on. Missing Mr. Proctor. Um, what do we know exactly what they're investigating um, about him specifically? They did say Massachusetts State Police has revealed that it is with regard to the Karen Reed case. Yeah, she kills telling it. me. She's like, I hate my. She says my beard is getting too white. Fact or a side defense. Interesting piece of evidence. Daryl Cohen. Wait, let me see this. Part. Bad fact. Talk this in an odd way today, but from Steph Z cardio dance, she's got to be in good shape. How do you explain microscopic pieces of tail light found on his clothes? Again, bad fact for the defense. Interesting piece of evidence, Daryl Cohen. How do you explain microscopic taillight? Oh, it's really simple. They took a hammer and they smashed the taillight and then they sprinkled it on there. That's how you get it on there. Otherwise, you know how hard it is to break a taillight into microscopic pieces? Are you fucking kidding me? And we are to believe that somehow those got on all over his clothing after a slow, you know what I mean? Like how, however many miles an hour in reverse accident, which only the taillight was damaged. Okay. Okay. Listen to this guy. Bad fact or a good fact, whether or not you're from the prosecution side or you're from the defense side. This guy. Each side believes 
what they believe and the facts and the evidence will come out in the trial if it doesn't end up. Why is this guy even on the fucking panel? Have you ever heard somebody say, like, let me, the guy asks him, is the tail, is the microscopic tail leg good or bad for the defense? This is his fucking answer. Defense, interesting piece of evidence, Daryl Cohen. Bad fact or a good fact, whether or not you're from the prosecution side or you're from the defense side. Oh, it's a, it's a bad fact or a good fact. That's his answer. Each side believes what they believe and the facts and the evidence will come out in the trial. Each side believes what they believe and the facts and evidence will come out in the trial. Why the fuck is this guy on a panel? Like, have you ever heard anything less insightful or interesting? And then let's get this fucking guy on here. He'll say something generic and cookie cutter. I mean, you could literally take that sentence and apply it to any case, any fucking like what? Oh my God. Like, tell me you, it's like these people, somebody explained this earlier. Uh, it's like they read the back of the book and they're trying to do the book report to the class. That's what this is. If it doesn't end up destroyed before the trial, not the evidence, but the trial itself. Yes. It's, yeah. Predictably unpredictable. Oh, good. Oh, predictably um, un- like that's this it? is an interesting comment. Why Annie K is always has on? interesting comments, uh, and she's in the chat once again. This is for Megan, I think. Um, and she's teaching the media class. Story nefarious is so we're talking about so many people, I think people on both law enforcement, um, civilians, uh other responders. It would be a, a stretch, it would be very hard. For this many people, I think, to keep a conspiracy together without someone cracking, which does- by the way, I'm so sick of hearing that too. But oh, it's so many people. It's not so many people. It's like four people and Proctor. That's it. The, the whole point is if these people had done any research into this, they would know that like they they lied about what time Caitlin Albert left the house. We now know that Caitlin Albert left the house at 145. Brian and Nicole told police that she left at 12.15, which means that she was never questioned by police because she wasn't there when John O'Keefe got there. Except she was there. The the getting Colin out of the house at 12.15 thing, getting Caitlin out of the house at 12.15, getting all of these people out of the house before John got there, the whole purpose of that was so that they had less people involved in the conspiracy. The less people involved, the less you're going to fuck it up. It's that simple. It's really just that simple. It's not a big, it's not a big conspiracy. It's like four people, all of whom are family, all of whom are looking out for each other's interests, all of whom don't want to see somebody in their family go to jail over what they probably thought was an accident. And then the detective who's friends with them all, who's like, who controls who gets questioned and who does not. And from there, it's really just simple. People trust institutions buchanan and tully they're they're gonna back up proctor because back the you know thin blue line back the blue we got to support our buddy you know cops protect cops that's that simple district attorney's office i trust my troopers i trust my troopers they wouldn't lie to me you know and then the general public just like then you get the cucks like carl they're like karen's mean to me karen's mean to me so she must be guilty it's just that fucking simple. It's not that big of a conspiracy. They're acting like it's like so, oh, somebody would have cracked. Why would they crack? They're all family. Why would they crack? Doesn't mean, by the way, that someone won't crack at some point here. Oh um, we don't know. I think there's also the idea, what maybe some people haven't realized here, is that people might be unwittingly involved in this conspiracy. Oh, really? Right? The first responder who said that Karen said, I hit him, uh, maybe that person is relating what they heard or what they thought they heard, but they're not part of a conspiracy. Yes, they're just kind of true. getting lumped in. So I think we're assuming that everyone here is a bad actor and that might not be the truth, but assuming that there's more than three or four is very complicated and uh, hard to keep. To say and, and let me jump in, Joel, just oh, for yeah. a second. Let's hear what you have sometimes Let's see what you have sometimes it's not necessarily a conspiracy that people don't crack, but in a conversation that's overheard, right. they may have dropped, oh my gosh, I shouldn't have said that. And they don't realize they shouldn't have said that it's until late. it comes out later. So 
I think, and I agree, this conspiracy, if it exists, they all deserve their SAG cards and they should get Oscars and Emmys because they've learned their copy very well. They've got the script and they've done it well. I just think it's too much to say that all of these people are involved in a mega conspiracy. I bet you this guy could not name. If you ask this guy right now, tell me five people involved in this case. Can you do that? Can you give me the names of five people? He doesn't know a goddamn fucking thing. Everything he's saying is just speaking in generalities. Oh yeah. It's hard to keep a conspiracy. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No shit. Sherlock. But there's not that many people involved. Do you do you know anything about this case, dumbass? Do you know anything? Daryl Cohen, please forward your uh, hate mail to me so I can take joy in reading it. It'll be fun. Uh, <laughs> Patricia Seibold or Seibold. Uh, Joel, great panel. Love to the classiest, best attorney, Melanie. She is massively intelligent and pretty. Can't oh, sister is this Jen McCabe. Her husband is Matt McCabe. Then on the Albert side, you hey. have Kevin Albert, who's with the Canton. Listen, to, listen to her. Um, Ryan Albert Just is. Listen to her compared to the other panelists like how is it that hard to find somebody people who know the facts like she knows the name she knows kevin albert she knows who jennifer mccabe is she knows the familiar relationship this guy this guy could not tell you any names i guarantee if you were like who's chris albert he would have no fucking clue who that is none absolutely fucking none and Melanie's the only one on this panel who has done any research. This just offends me as a person that has covered this case extensively. It's like, why even bother talking about it if you don't know what the fuck you're talking about? With the Boston PD. And then their brother, Chris, is a politician in town. His wife, Julie, and he have a son named Colin, who everyone swears wasn't in the house, yes. but maybe he was. He also drives a Ford Edge that the plow driver saw a Ford Edge parked in front of the house where the body was found. There, it's not that many people. And when all yes, of them are related yes. and or working in the same police departments that are involved in this investigation and the lead investigator, his mother said that the Albert family was like their second family. Another, yeah. It's like, you know, like, look at them. All right. The mafia doesn't exist, but if it did exist, they were able to keep a lot of secrets. Right. So I just, when people say it's this huge conspiracy, would you lie to save a, a member of your family? Um, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe something happened inside the house. You know, maybe somebody didn't murder him. It could have been an accident. But yeah. so how did a car hit him? So so what do you make of these microscopic pieces of taillight? Is that is that and oh, I, again, I'm asking well, this from a place of ignorance. Is that no. part of the conspiracy? First of all, I think you might find that polycarbonate does not shatter yes. into microscopic pieces. <laughs> Number two, you might find out that the 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 pieces of taillight at the scene were not found until after Trooper Proctor drove 40 miles, had the car towed back this is 40 great. miles. She's they were discovered cool. 10 hours uh, later on top of the snow after give 12 more inches of snow fell. Give it to he him. also took possession of Officer John O'Keefe's clothes and did not log them into evidence for weeks. The chain of custody issues here alone are enough reasonable doubt to drive a truck through so riddle me that <laughs> <laughs> i mean this this is again this is why it, it, like every if you're gonna talk about this you should know this stuff this is the basics she's got it every the and look at she's like the girl underneath her is convinced now i don't know what her position was before this but she's schooling her with facts she's great She's fantastic. Comes, I'm not following this for full disclosure the way most of the people who are following this are following it. But um, just hearing Melanie talk again, first of all, anytime an attorney says anything, I've said this before in the show, I'm like, oh yeah, that's definitely true. Um, and I'm not saying that, you know, Melanie is just speaking facts here. Um, I thought there were injuries below the neck. I never knew this until this very moment that there were absolutely no injuries uh, below the neck. Daryl, you seem a more skeptical let's put it that way how come oh let's hear this because the more people involved in a case a conspiracy the more likely a leak one way or the other and having known that it's all family families fight oh. husband and wives what? fight and when they fight they utter words they mean and sometimes don't mean and many times don't want anybody to hear so i am convinced 
Not that she's guilty, not that she's innocent, not that she's not guilty. What do you but do? I'm convinced that if there is a conspiracy, they are doing, as I previously mentioned, a wonderful job of conspiring. And maybe they're perspiring as they conspire, but this is boss. He doesn't know if, if she's guilty. He doesn't know if she's innocent. He just wants to hear himself talk. That's all this is. This guy just wants to hear himself talk. He has no idea if she's guilty or innocent because he hasn't looked into this case at all. He knows generally from his experience as a prosecutor that conspiracies are hard to keep in place. We know that everybody fucking knows that, but this is kind of a unique case because the players involved who he doesn't know anything fucking about anything. Oh, and it's cold. So I don't know. It's oh, yeah. there's too much here. This is not a perfect case. And these are cases we love. These are cases we love to comment on. These are cases we love to watch as they're being tried because they are like a soap opera that's unscripted. So it's unscripted TV in a courtroom before his or her honor. Uh, Megan, there's a comment in here, and I'm going to hop back uh, to okay. Daryl and then over to Melanie. I'm happy no more Daryl. No more Daryl. That. But Claudia here says uh, the trial. In years of research also in our area in the people all right well we'll, we'll call it a, a break there you guys get the point uh but uh why don't i read a, do we have any more turtle chests to read here oh, we got one from mr b sends five bucks and says melanie on panel on fire absolutely she was great so all right anyone else have any more questions or anything they want to talk about before we end the program oh, we got uh, another cash app here from laura mcgillis says Ten dollars says Karen, you got this. Stay strong, absolutely, Karen. Shout out to Karen Reed. Hopefully, she's watching this, and uh, I hope she's not too worried. I'm sure her father's a little worried, but uh, you know. Oh, can we talk about Tully visiting more people? So, Tully, I get a call today from a really nice turtle rider. She's all upset. It's her birthday, and she her ex boyfriend contacts her. And says, Tully and Bukaki just came to my house looking for you. Okay. Looking for you. And they have her phone number because she apparently texted Colin back in like July or something. Where'd it go? Okay. So this is uh, the text she sent her. Now, it's not the most pleasant text, but it goes, she tells him, be a good human and tell the truth. You and your uncle Brian, Jen McCabe, couldn't be more guilty. John O'Keefe may not have been your favorite person, but he was a good person. And sadly, you and all your family, along with Dirtbag Proctor, are trying to project Karen Reed as the killer. But guess what? So many are not fucking stupid and know all of what you and your scumbag family are up to. Do the right thing and tell the truth. So, again, I don't condone or encourage people going rogue like that and sending a, you know, sending a uh, a message like that to Colin Albert or whoever. But um, it's also a free country. You Anyone can fucking text anyone. Who am I to tell you not to call or text someone when I literally call and text people on the show all the time? Like, who am I to ever tell anyone else not to do that? But that message right there got her a visit from Bukaki and Tully. Why? And she called me. She's all upset. Are they gonna? What are they gonna do? I go. They don't want you. They want me. And they want Karen Reed. They want. They want you to say. Oh yeah, Turtle Boy coerced me into doing this. I was inspired by Turtle Boy. That's the narrative that they're going for. That is what they're looking for. But, you know, I would advise all people, if you ever see Bukaki or Tully come to your door, or any state cop, just take out your phone and film everything. And you can be the biggest cocksucker to them if you want, because that is your right. You could tell Bukaki and Tully to go fuck themselves if you want for covering up the murder of John O'Keefe. You owe them nothing. They ask you questions. The answer is lawyer, lawyer. I don't talk to pigs. I don't talk to corrupt cops. 
get the fuck off my property, you human thumb fuck, Brian Tully. Get the fuck out of here. I'm not some, you know, DCF mom that you can take advantage of, okay? Some mentally ill DCF mom with an axe to grind against Turtle Boy. I, you know, tell him to fuck off. You can do that. It's your right. So, all right. Anyone else have any questions? Where are Chrissy Mayer and Melanie Little on the blindy scale? I don't know what that means. All right. Anyone else have any questions? Yeah. Attorney Melanie Little, I watch her a lot. I watch all her Karen Reed streams. They're very good. It's good. I don't even listen to podcasts anymore. I just listen to YouTube streams about Karen Reed. Like that's all I listen to in the car whenever I have free time. I never like I'll probably listen to that whole surviving the survivor thing tomorrow. I'm getting the puppy soon this weekend. All right. Anyone else? All right. Anyone, anyone have any questions before we call it a night? What's the Commonwealth's, um, you see the part about not wearing uniforms? Somebody asked, what's the Commonwealth's uh, reason for not wanting cops? That's pretty standard. Like they actually did that with the Chestnut trial. That happens a lot. Sometimes they don't want officers like, that's kind of for the benefit of Karen Reed, actually, traditionally. Usually when someone's accused of killing a cop, um, they don't want the courtroom flooded with officers in uniform because it just, it can be a little bit intimidating and it's not fair to the defendant usually. Uh, but in this case, it's not a big deal because there's only one Boston cop that shows up and he's a cuck. His name's Carl Dougal and he comes in civilian clothing anyway. So that's kind of why that's all about. Uh, Ryder is a puppy. And it's spelled R-I-D-E-R, -E like Turtle Rider. It's a French bulldog. It's going to be dope. Are you going to be testifying since you're a witness? Uh, I mean, I, I had spoken with, I, I was on the list to be a witness in this trial. We'll see. Yeah, it can be prejudicial on jurors. So again, I'm not that opposed to the no uniform cops in court because it's just, you know, there's no need for it. I mean, would a firefighter come to court dressed as a fucking firefighter? No. It's like you come with a fucking suit on like anyone else. So I don't really object to that one as much. Now, if you were testifying, I mean, that would be one thing, you know. My next court hearing or hers. Hers is April 12th. Mine is April 23rd. Krusty Panties is being arraigned for witness intimidation on the 24th. And then on the 26th, I have another hearing across the street in Dedham District Court uh, for the fake victim that uh, says I violated the restraining order. Just such bullshit. It's not going anywhere. Not the least bit worried about it. Exactly. If that court, if Karen was truly guilty, that courtroom would be busting at the seams with the boys in blue. Make my mistake. Absolutely. Yeah. Kate is being charged with intimidating me. I'm a witness against her. All right. Trying to read up all the comments here. Thoughts on KP's comments on court TB? What comments on court TB? On me in court? I don't understand the question. What do you think of Puff Daddy? Uh, I haven't been paying attention. All I talk, I'll, the only thing I read about is Karen Reed. To be perfectly honest with you, I don't really follow anything else besides this case. 
What, what she was on was she on court TV? Was that real? No. Oh, she was in the chat. That was that was fucking insane. I mean, I made a tweet about it. I'll show you the tweet. I'm like, this is madness. Like she's on here <laughs> telling Vinny saying uh, she was literally, she paid like 30 bucks. Keep in mind, she's unemployed and she paid like 30 bucks to roast Vinny saying Karen Reed worked with turtle boy to intimidate witnesses and torment the O'Keefe family. So glad you're not a prosecutor anymore. You don't care about victims. Yeah. Kate Peter really cares about victims. Oh yeah. A lot. Big fan of the victims. I mean, I've, this is her whole thing is like pretending to be like, oh, I'm the champion of the, the, the downtrodden and the people who have been screwed over. No, she's not. She's just obsessed with me. That's all this is. Anyone useful to her who's like, who she can throw out and then and, and they can be exploited that way. She just uses them all. She's using them all. What else did she, I mean, this is madness. Jennifer McCabe did nothing wrong, nor did her children. Sure she did. Why did you support this egregious level of witness intimidation, Vinny? Oh, really? Egregious level of... I. <laughs> She's literally being charged with witness intimidation while saying that. Like, that's wild. You are a disgrace. Shilling for a murderer. She has tormented the victim's family and friends. I stand for the O'Keefe family. Oh, yeah, sure you do. Sure you do. And this, is, this was my favorite one that she posted. She goes, <laughs> I am not a spokesperson. I have connections to court TV and have summarily turned it down. Not just turned it down, summarily turned it down because she's really smart. She's not a spokesperson. She has connections to court TV. So she wants you guys to believe that like, you know, who we got to get on here on the panel tonight on court TV, the chick with the high school degree from that lives in the unemployed chick from North Attleboro uh, with the abusive druggy boyfriend and the out of control 17 year old who threatens little kids and who lost two of her other kids to the state and is obsessed is, you know, singularly obsessed with turtle boy and is currently being charged with not only felony witness intimidation, but also violation of a harassment prevention order against the same woman that she was also charged with a few months ago. We got to get her on panel. We got to get her up there, but she got the call and then, you know, she goes, she's like, no, I'm summarily declining you. Lots of people believe that. Lots of people believe that. Oh, that's inappropriate. <laughs> Stop that. Stop that. Okay. Um, next on Court TV, we have Crust TV. So we have special guests. She of Crusted Panties. Interesting. Anyone else have any questions? I know. I did not mean to bring that one up. I'm just clicking on random things here. <laughs> I really wasn't. I just click on shit. Um, all right. Anyway, love Mary summarily obsessed with you. I'd say so. She said she works for PA. She says a lot of things. Uh, all right. Um, anyway, we're, I'm going to call it a night, guys, because uh, it's getting... Oh, we got one more turtle chat. $50 from Lynette. She says, Aiden, you are simply amazing. I thank you for putting your life on hold to fight for the freedom of Karen and for the freedom of speech. Could you give a shout-out to my sister, a fellow turtle rider? Her name is Lauren Morocco. Shout-out to Lauren Morocco, the turtle rider out there. Love you. Love you. And, uh, you know, I didn't mean to put my life on hold for this. I was living my life and I didn't want to go to jail. I'm still pissed off. I went to jail. It's so whack, you know, so whack. I didn't belong in jail, but anyway, uh, never going back either. I'm free. I'm law abiding and I'm never going back to jail. So, all right, guys. Um, we'll see you guys, uh, Thursday night for the next episode of the live show. Peace turtle riders. <laughs>